very good morning uh, and a cloudy morning today uh, across the country, most of the places in the country. Uh, but for us, it's been illuminating uh, morning because uh, people don't have to go to Norway uh, to see the uh, northern lights or the galaxy of stars. They have all descended down in this program called as Deciphering ADA, the Indian Perspective. Uh, before I go ahead with the formal introduction of the uh, course coordinator, I welcome uh, heartily the course coordinators, the respected moderators, the speakers who have really uh, given all of that they can to make this event a very live, interesting program. Uh, Corona Remedies has got two sophisticated plants uh, catering to the Indian population and the international markets as such. Uh, we have an R&D center approved by the DSIR and at the same time we have got more than 3000 people working in the organization day in and day out so that the patients do get what they deserve. We are a company which not only believes in very high quality of product but also believes in affordability because the patient has to take these medications for a lifetime. Uh, before I hand over the session to Dr. Murthy, I would like to introduce him. Uh, today I am very, very happy that you know I have not by blood father and one year elder brother and one younger brother who, who are a part of this allied panel. So uh, let me take the privilege of introducing our course coordinator for the day, uh, Dr. S. Murthy. Dr. S. Murthy is the director uh, of Endocrine Research Lab and Diabetes Research Center at Chennai. Uh, Dr. Murthy uh, has actually the privilege and honor of opening up the first hormone assay lab in 1986 when in Chennai there were uh, no endocrinologists actually. So uh, those are the days where Dr. Murthy started his endocrine practice and uh, from there on uh, Dr. Murthy has several accolades to his credit. He has been uh, awarded as a lifetime achievement award by the Dr. MGR University in Chennai. Uh, Dr. Murthy has uh, three theses of PhD who are students uh, for him and he has completed three PhDs thesis for them and other than that he has been an author co-author in five publications and journals as such so uh, without uh, taking away much time and going into the scientific program the entire program has been a module designed to cater the needs of those who felt that you know ADA this time is very difficult because it was virtual and night and hence we could decipher some topics and bring it down and let the Indian doctors give the perspective of it over to Dr. S. Murthy Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. And uh, the session is all yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vijay, for those kind words. It's indeed a privilege to be part of this very interesting meeting, Deciphering ADA 2021 Scientific Sessions and Interesting and Indian Perspective, Part 2. Deciphering ADA has been a concept which has been brought by Corona Remedies and they put in a lot of effort to, you know, look at all the important sessions which occurred in ADA this year. And from that they chose 56 of them and from there they have shortlisted 18 which would be of relevance to the Indian scenario. And for this, we have a galaxy of 12 eminent faculties from endocrinology, cardiology, and nephrology, each one an authority in their own rights from different part of the world. And to get started, I will just in the format, there are three modules. Each module is for one hour. And after the moderator uh, starts, there are three speakers. Each speaker talk will be for 15 minutes. And the last 15 minutes will be an interaction with the model and the question answer. And finally, for the last couple of minutes, I'll come in for the takeaway. To start, may I first invite Dr. V. Thomas Paul as the moderator. He is Professor and Head Department of Endocrinology, Christian Medical College, Vellur, member of the Endocrine Society of India and ISBMR, actively involved in clinical work, teaching and research, reviewer for many national and international journals, and published more than 120 papers in peer-reviewed journals, got the prestigious P.N. Shah Memorial Oration in 2017, 
He has been a principal investigator of several international osteoporosis related clinical trials and is currently the president of the Endocrine Society of Art and Puducherry. Uh, welcome, Dr. Thomas V. Paul. The stage is yours. Muthi, sir, and thank you, Corona Remedies, uh, Mr. Vijay, for this opportunity. I won't waste any time. The first talk is by Padma Shri, Dr. Sashang Joshi. He doesn't need any introduction. He, in fact, he was my teacher in many meetings also. Sir is a consultant endocrinologist, Leelavati and Bhatia Hospital, Joshi Clinic. He is the president of Indian Academy of Diabetes, chair of South East Asia chapter IDF, past president of Endocrine Society of India. He has got over more than 800 research publications to his credit and he is emeritus editor of JAPI and he was ex-editor of IGIM and he, is a, he was a past president of AIARO and he was awarded International Clinician of the Year 2012 by the American College of Endocrinology. Sir is going to give his talk on debate, precision nutrition, are we there yet? Over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul, for your kind words. Uh, I don't deserve them. And Dr. Murthy, and my good friend Vijay Chalru from Corona Remedies. I never thought that when they named Corona Remedies, Corona, they would be Corona which would disrupt our lives. And we won't meet physically, but we'll have to meet virtually. Uh, you see, the topic today, which I am going to discuss, is that there was a debate at the ADA 2021 on precision nutrition between are we ready for prime time and yes and no. And let us look at what they spoke at that. Then what I will do is like look at the readiness of this debate. Are we really there? What is there beyond the debate which occurred at the ADA in the PubMed field? And do we have some other data which is available with us? And is personalized nutrition going to be a part of that? In fact, on this very same topic from a team in Bangalore called Twin Health, I'm one of the co-authors. We also had a paper on precision nutrition as a poster abstract at the very same idea, which also I will make a passing mention of. So let us look at the core topic. We are what we eat. You know that the food cooked in every household across the world is different. So the debate was precision nutrition. Are we ready for prime time? And it was defended by Dr. Paul W. Franks. He is the scientific director of patient care and he co-chairs the ADA ESD initiative on precision diabetes initiative. What Dr. Paul Franks emphasized was the investment in precision nutrition research. Can they have a translational impact and that should be the need of the hour. And precision medicine is nothing but tailoring the various approaches so that we can ensure that we can predict glycemic responses. So his first thing was that is it possible to achieve personalized nutrition by predicting glycemic responses. So fundamentally they presented data of 10 year follow up of diabetes incidence and weight loss from the diabetes prevention program outcome study. And Dr. Franks very nicely mentioned that the diabetes incidence was delayed by 36 months with lifestyle modification while with metformin it was only delayed by 12 months. So obviously we need to look at the various biological characteristics, the genomic influences of the response because you can have responders and these responders can optimize our dietary choices. Now for example we have the similar situations in India and I will discuss my abstract a little later. Dr. Franks discussed a study quoted in the science journal called Cell, where he revealed that it is possible to achieve personalized nutrition by predicting the glycemic responses, by ensuring that we can get inputs from the gut microbiome, from the blood test results, 
from various questionnaires from oxology and anthropometry and now the latest buzzword of estimating the time in range through the continuous glucose monitoring practices the core of the universe today is the patient and we have to focus all our goals on patient centric outcomes not just biological outcomes and in a very nice way professor frank highlighted the need for generating good quality evidence in the live trial space the rt rct space and we have seen that for example we had the luca hit trial we had the direct trial these are all lifestyle trials and the dpp program which were funded by nih which shows the relevance of nutrition and its impact on glycemic and weight biology and that's something which we need to recognize so dr franks very nicely pointed out that it is important to understand the meaning of glucose variability and the concept of patient centric outcomes and obviously it is equally important because at the end of the day it is the universe is our patient so it's very very crucial to know that we need to adapt and adapt and recognize so what is precision nutrition i will deviate a little bit and talk to us about our rct which is ongoing in bangalore with dr paresh samina and many others are doing it's a multi centric rct using an artificial intelligence program where we measure in type 2 diabetics who are less than 8 years of age and in that what we are doing is one group is having standard care and the other group is having a cgm is giving a weight scale is doing ambulatory blood pressure monitoring they are also measuring the detailed deep dive on what they are eating through a personalized coach they are looking at a fitbit to ensure physical activity and the sleep pattern and they are also connected to their doctor this is a comprehensive twin precision treatment program we presented that as a poster at dada what we did is that we took all the inputs from the labs from the sensors for blood pressure and glucose both and predicted glycemic responses every day a coach was connected to the patient to guide them through an app and through telephonic communication what to do and what not to do and then the database was confirmed back with the doctor and the doctor was guiding and we observed that after 6 months we were able to take off most of the patients of medications with type 2 diabetes of a short duration see restricted dieting of direct trial is tough to do so we were presenting first piece of precision medicine with precision nutrition at ada which supported what dr frank said so it's very very crucial to recognize and implant that particular point now the debate always will have two sides of a coin and obviously we had a very very elegant scientist in kevin d hall who is a senior investigator at the national institutes of digestive diseases and diabetes at the nih in bethesda maryland and he told that precision nutrition is not ready for prime time he enumerated the various assumptions that precision medicine is based on assumption biology individuals have a very variable response on the same nutritional interventions and therefore some are responders and some are non responders for example if i eat idli dosa if my friend and our professor thomas paul eats idli dosa professor dr murthy eats idli dosa and vijay chaldu eats idli dosa their glycemic response of all the four of us is going to be different also remember that responses are reproducible within individuals but the variable individual responses can be predicted by omomics microbiota physiology social economic and environmental influences so remember for the same meal there is a variable glucose response from one individual to another individual that's what dr hall emphasized so there is some degree of unpredictability and the meal ranked order glucose excursion from one individual may not rank similarly for another and therefore he shared examples of discordant simultaneous glucose excursions where the same <coughs> same individual with more than 2 cgms recorded two different responses for the same meal 
so there are lot of factors which affect the area under the curve and there is a lot of imprecision even within the gold standard methods of measuring the energy intake which has a considerable variability on weight outcome so he explained through mathematical models kevin hall explained that the weight change human metabolism could evaluate physical activity food intake baseline demographics and compute body fat and body weight and based on all these data points they are not very reliable there are lot of limitations so conclusion of professor hall was that there are some considerations of precision nutrition he wanted to put on table the first was that there is a substantial imprecision on the gold standard methods of measuring energy equations of the intake of the food which imparted some variability on outcomes second is that how much is the variability biological which is the signal related how much is due to the limits of the methodological precision which is the noise is not known and that limits the accuracy of the outcomes and we need to do controlled feeding trials but they necessarily may not solve the existing problems so it is not ready for prime time if you ask me in my final comment we are in a learning curve you see we are in lifestyle medicine today in the era of lifestyle medicine we have tools to measure but these tools to measure should be efficiently used for a behavioral change so if you ask me lifestyle is not just about eating about physical activity about sleep about medications but also about happiness and positivity and if you get an integrated index which we are able to put through an artificial algorithm and use artificial intelligence use them and handhold it through a coach a diabetic coach and then it is supervised by an endocrine expert then probably precision medicine can be the order of the day and precision nutrition is the key cog in that because as i said food cooked in every household across the world is different the glycemic responses are different the fat to carb ratio is different so there is some degree of unpredictability which we can precisely estimate once we do a pattern recognition and that's what that digital twin type of programs do they pattern recognize and once we are able to do pattern recognize they make corrections and these corrections then will reset the metabolism and you might even be able to reverse diabetes or reduce the need for medicines so remember that we are living in an era where we are able to quantify a lot of our things which we could not do in the past for example using the modern techniques of artificial intelligence we can plot area under the curves of glycemic responses with the easy availability of sensors for glucose easy availability of tools like blood pressure measurements the weighing scales the ketone body monitoring as well as the sleep activity and fitbit patterns so today's modern diabetology and endocrinology has lifestyle measurements as a key components and when we personalize that it becomes precision and in that probably the main cog will be precision nutrition i think i will stop here and when there is a discussion around this topic i will come back again to discuss so remember this debate centers around the ethos of precision nutrition what to eat when to eat how to respond and how to either manage or reverse diabetes thank you dr paul for the um, allowing me to speak in this meeting thank you very much sir it was so so amazing as usual so amazing so it was so informative and in last 15 minutes your contents is so much i think already there are questions sir i will put it across to you at the end of it sir thank you very much uh, we will go to the next speaker it is my privilege to introduce dr prakash k asra who is a direct is a cardiologist director of cardiac cath lab amri hospital kolkata and uh, he is a specialist wireless pacemaker rdn specialist 24 years experience in angioplasty heart attack care heart failure care first to conduct that's a very important credit point transcatheter aortic valve replacement in eastern india
faculty in various uh, national and international conferences. Of course, we all know that uh, uh, dapagliflozin have a targeted impact on heart, lung, kidney, and other organ uh, systems. Uh, Dr. P.K. Asra is going to talk to us on efficacy and safety of dapagliflozin in patients with and without type 2 diabetes hospitalized with COVID. We are talking about one communicable disease and non-communicable disease blend and results from their 19 global randomized control trial. Over to you, Dr. Astra. Thank you, Dr. Paul, uh, for your kind introductions. I'm a practicing cardiologist and I do care. Uh, I do practice in a private sector and most of the acute cardiac care patients are under me. Now, in COVID time, we had two waves and we have one trial. So the DARE 19 is basically a trial for the first wave. And there is a distinct difference between what ADA has said 2021 based on first wave. And there will be separate discussion, maybe a extended leg of the trial or similar trial retrospective an experience of quickened. So there is distinct difference between the mortality between first wave and the second wave in our hospital. Now there are two different sections of treating COVID patients with or without diabetes, with or without heart failure, with or without heart ailment in our hospital and most of the private sector in India. So definitely it makes a sense to differentiate and there is a distinct trend of difference in the treatment protocol between a cardiologist, endocrinologist, and intensivist. In our hospital, I'm sure it is there in other hospital. So during the first wave, when COVID came, there was a lot of concern that dapagliflozins in COVID patients, if they are admitted in a critical conditions, their euglycemic DKA, the glycemic control, glycemic variability, and the benefit of dapagliflozins for organ protections may actually cause more harm than benefit. So that concept or that myth has been broken by ADA consensus and a distinct discussions on their 19 trial. Though the primary endpoint could not be met, again, it is a small trial in the domain of SGL2, but it's a very large trial in the domain of SGL2 dapagliflozins in sick patients. So if you talk about sickness and if you talk about COVID, this is a very good trial. And unfortunately, it missed the primary endpoint by having a confidence interval crossing one by 10. But what we have learned from this DER-19 trial, and that has also been, uh, I mean, uh, I've been stressed by many uh, investigators who was a part of the trial, and many people who has continued diapagiflosis during COVID-19, is that it is very safe, though the number uh, statistically may not be significant from lung point of view, from cardiac point of view and nephrology point of view. So it is a statistical loss or statistically, uh, statistically it could not win, but it gave a lot of confidence amongst us, especially in COVID patients. And there are 19 talks about mainly hypertensive patients, 50% diabetic patients, and it is not a pure heart failure trial. It is not a pure CKD trial because the number of patients in there 19 is very small. So what we have learned that uh, in India, especially in my hospital, I have not changed my practice for the last five years, whether it is systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, heprep, embrep. If somebody has got heart failure, acute heart failure, we do prescribe dapagliflozins and other progenies. We have evidence from soloist trial for acute decompensated heart failure. We have an evidence with sodagliflozins in preserved ejection fractions, and we will have more data in MPRS. We have data from DAPA-HF and MPAR-RED 
we have embaric for heart failure the definition of heart failure has also changed after covid there is universal definitions and in all forms of heart failure stage a stage b stage c stage d definitely it makes a sense to use if they are admitted with covid now in covid if you have uh, uh, bacterial sepsis where you can go back to your glp1 that is my standard practice and there's a daily dose of uh, liraglutide in my uh, critical care and that is injectable and second choice definitely is insulin is only insulin is very safe but in cardiac care if you prescribe glp1 injectable the monitoring the range of uh, uh, glycemic variability hyperglycemia and uh, unmonitored because of covid time there is a crunch of health professionals there is a crunch of uh, the doctors junior doctors is very difficult to monitor each and every patient every 2 hours on the sugar so dapagliprogen in glp1 was a standard practice in my unit and we have treated many hundreds of patients on dapagliprogen and glp1 by standard protocol in my hospital but it may go uh, against the myths or i would say medical uh, uh, tribalism or what is medical tribalism that means that some group of people they still believe metformin and insulin on all forms of acute care in 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 during covid they don't want it to come out but it's a new idea and i don't think it uh, makes uh, it, it it may be provocative but it makes sense to use this kind of uh, altered uh, uh, protocol in special situations so dapagliflozin in their 19 has established one thing that it is safe and if you develop udk or you are puking you are not able to eat and if you are on ventilator or on rails to feeding then the scene may be different uh, uh, it's no point giving a cross tablet through the rails tube so mechanically ventilated patient they are maintain or glp1 or insulin but on the contrary in acute care or endocrine care or intensivist care it was only insulin Uh, short acting rapid acting insulin there are thousands of varieties of insulin thousands of protocols and thousands of uh, monitoring the, these patients initially we started having a continuous monitoring in our hospital but again we ran out of the supply and uh, the manpower so it makes sense to continue dapagliflozin who are coming here in the opd those who are not on mechanical ventilations those who are not requiring inotropic support like norads or other things those who are not uh, uh, cardiogenic shock or uh, those who are not requiring a uh, bypass surgery so these are the people who are relatively stable and ready to go home they are, they should get back their dapagliflozin projects when they get back home and most of the time it has been stopped by the primary physician and it has been reintroduced in our hospital if they come back with uh, symptomatic covid uh, not that sick patients that mean they are able to eat uh, they are producing good amount of urine in in uh, diabetes or any other form uh, this type 2 diabetes the dk is very rare in elderly eu dk is very easy to manage and nobody dies due to eu dk like angioedema uh, due to any uh, s inhibitor or rd so eu dk uh, is should not be a really concern you should give fluid you should give their insulinopenic and you should give some amount of uh, insulin and they do tolerate dapagliflozin so i'm not proposing that all patient needs dapagliflozin but who needs dapagliflozin who needs this sgl2 should be continued under monitoring their bicarbonate their blood gases their uh, ckds their creatinine level all should be mon- monitored after having dapagliflozin thousands of thousands of patients in last uh, or all forms of sgl2 in last 5 years we have seen the incidence of udk in my lifetime treating more than 7000 patients on sgl2 is only two and i have never seen anybody dying due to udk and uh, it's not uh, different in uh, uh, in the covid time what you have to do you have to stop and give fluid and uh, chance of uh, other infections are definitely high pyelonephritis only one so it is very safe and that has been reinforced by cosibor or uh, uh, dr verma and many other uh, scientists that it is safe it has not met the primary endpoint so uh, what i can conclude here the dapagliflozin is very effective in all forms of heart failure we'll have more data we have i have learned from cbd real that is going to be effective for all forms of heart failure if you have a clinical syndromes of heart failure with pro bnp rise troponin rise irrespective of the ejection fractions it should be given 
Now we also know there is a difference between men and women's heart failure. The ejection fraction is uh, there is a gradient of five percent between men and women. Uh, uh, I definitely makes sense to use more frequently in men, though they are uh, not uh, should should not be any discriminations. But there is more data that men are more uh, towards heart failure at fifty percent ejection fractions and uh, fifty percent ejection fractions. Uh, sorry, women are more ha having heart failure at fifty percent ejection fraction than men. 50% ejection fraction may be a normal for men, and there is a gradient of 5 to 5%, 5 and some people say 3%, especially in Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is my last sentence that Apaki project is safe. India 19, we should continue. And with some interruption, if there is a bacterial sepsis, overwhelming sepsis, and a shock like condition. So, over to you, Dr. Paul. Oh, thank you very much. It was very clear and it was quite informative. And also, it highlighted the main point by the physicians, no? their concern of uh, whether to use in an acute setting, especially on the background of COVID. Of course, there are questions waiting for you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Astra. We will get, take the questions at the end. Now, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Sri Bhushan Raju and he is the professor and head department of nephrology Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences Hyderabad and he the, is a best teacher so that has been recognized by the government of Telangana by he received that award and also another prestigious award is ABJ Abdul Kalam Excellency Award. Several chapters he has co authored in textbooks and he has got so many publications and national, international pub, uh, journals. And uh, he is going to highlight us on ADA Joint ADA ASN Symposium New Therapies for Kidney Protection in Diabetes. Of course, we are getting more and more uh, information. ARB, ACE, SGLT2 inhibitor. We are going to listen to it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sribush and Raju for agreeing to this. Over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, so nice of you for kind introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you all today morning, that uh, to on a Sunday, and uh, with a lot of enthusiasm to be in academicians across this country of various specialities. And with the backdrop of uh, Corona being rampant and also getting into the third wave, probably we'll be seeing more and more uh, cases of not only the Corona, probably in the future, more and more cases of diabetes that we have been watching in our routine day to day clinical practice that some of the patients are for the first time becoming de novo detected to have diabetes or probably their diabetes getting worsened, maybe because of the stress involved or probably also the drug therapies which are involved in the treatment of uh, Corona and uh, our OPDs are getting flooded with a lot of such cases. And probably I predict that whatever we have been thinking about diabetes, that is the leading cause of mortality and morbidity in the world, in the future it is going to further exceed the numbers what we predicted few years back, especially the country like ours, which is, which is already the capital of diabetes in the world, and more so in South India, and more so that Hyderabad is being labeled as the diabetic capital in our country. Uh, with some of the previous research uh, uh, organizations previously. Now we are worried that the diabetes is going to take a toll. And uh, more and more uh, in the nephrology practice, we see that diabetes is the most common cause of kidney failure. It's called end-stage renal disease. And those on renal replacement therapy, we see almost nearly 40 to 50% of these patients are having an underlying etiology of diabetes as the cause of kidney failure. So we are really uh, uh, struggling to get one drug that can, few drugs at least, that can really uh, prevent the progression of a chronic kidney disease. And uh, thank God that we were getting ACE inhibitors and ARBs since a long time. When compared to the other physicians and including the cardiologists and endocrinologists, we are, we are probably more biased towards ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And we have been using ACE inhibitors, ARBs since a long time, not only the diabetic, kidney disease, but also other kidney diseases involving glomerular disease and tubular interstitial kidney diseases. But we were probably we start a bit late and the patients come to us are referred to us a bit late. And though we have been using them, uh, 
but unfortunately we are not getting the appropriate uh, uh, benefit which is supposed to be given by these particular drugs and still we are waiting for wonderful drugs that can make a difference and as far as the diabetic kidney disease is concerned the one which is which is almost taking almost 50 percent of our clinical practice and also the contributing significantly to the morbidity and mortality in the patients treated by us we have been waiting for some wonderful drugs which can really make a difference and the day by day you know that the patients on renal replacement therapy is also increasing and in order to decrease the number of patients on renal replacement therapy we are supposed to get some of the good drugs and recently for the past few years around five to seven years we have been getting good drugs with the sglt2 receptor inhibitors which have made a difference in our therapeutic armamentarium as far as the diabetic kidney disease is concerned and at least uh, I'm very happy to share that I was one of the principal investigators of much uh, much discussed the credence, the canagliflozone and the renal outcome uh, in diabetes with established nephropathy in clinical evaluation, the credence trial. And uh, we found that the, the CANA has made a big difference as far as the patient management is concerned. And a uh, good number of the patients got benefited and we have been using this already in the clinical practice and that made it a big impact as far as the management of diabetic kidney disease is concerned and we, initially we were very skeptical about this particular drug being made when I, I gave a talk around seven years six years back about the SGLT2 inhibitors whether they are going to make a difference or not I was not so sure about it prior to this particular credence trial, trial. but after that and before that as far as the diabetic management is concerned it was very well established by that time with the credence trial and Empareg that trial also before that has made a big difference and the four molecules which have been approved by the FDA that uh, establishing the management the the these role of these drugs in the management of diabetes as for the kidney is concerned the credence was prematurely stopped as by noting that the significant number of the patients already got benefited out of this particular molecule and our only problem major problem which we faced was the the euglycemic ketoacidosis and the recurrent unit rat infections especially the fungal genital infections and some of the patients had cellulitis of the lower limb but, but fortunately none of the patients recruited in our group of people were having requiring uh, amputations but that some of the scientists have reported definitely an improvement increase in the number of cases requiring amputations of the lower limb uh, despite the fact with these kind of a complications being seen frequently but these people drugs have made a big difference as well as the improvement in some of the surrogate markets of improvement something like especially the outcomes that, that's something like in nephrology practice where we see doubling of serum creatinine and reaching instead renal disease and a decreased reduction in the amount of proteinuria which we see and these drugs have made an impact significantly and uh, uh, nowadays we have been seeing good number of type 1 diabetes also these drugs probably might show some uh, improvement in the glycemic control of these patients with uh, type 1 diabetes also one study is already ongoing with the one the sotagliflozone which is the uh, a combination of both SGL2, S1 and 2 uh, inhibitor and probably that's going to make an impact. And uh, uh, this particular ADA as far as the topic given to me is that how it is making a difference and uh, some of the highlights probably I can uh, make a, re a read out. Sorry for the delay. And ADA has published, uh, uh, attempted to uh, address this particular importance of SGLT2 inhibition as one of the protective agents in diabetic kidney disease. The Pirkovic in ADA 2021 has actually highlighted this part, his particular work. He was a dean, he's a dean of medicine at University of uh, South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And he was also one of the steering committee members of one of the very important uh, uh, studies related to kidney, the credence uh, testing, carmelina, sonar, and converse. I'm fortunate to be one of the two principal investigators of uh, two particular studies called credence and testing under him. The number of people as the quoted in this particular is uh, study requiring renal replacement therapy is projected to be doubled by 2030 and uh, by 2025. And almost nearly significant number of these patients, 629 million population would be having a diabetes as the underlying etiology of ki uh, ki kidney failure. But gas inhibitors and ARB alone may not be suitable and may not totally prevent the onslaught of kidney injury secondary to diabetes and we require more and more drug therapies. The establishment of these particular drugs by renal and IDNT have actually over a period of time failed gradually because we were requiring 
more and more renal protection by the several other drugs and SGLT2 inhibitors have come up to rescue. And uh, the it's widespread benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors have been established, especially the reduction in albuminuria, the decrease in the oxidative stress, and intrarenal angiotensin nogen upregulation, improving the renal oxygenation and efficacy efficiency of substrate utilization, improved autophagy and reduction in fibrosis, inflammation, arterial stiffness, and uh, as well as a simple and variable control of the blood pressure. So with these established outcomes, not only that the cardiovascular outcomes and was also established in the particular uh, study, and uh, there's a 60% six, reduction in the EGFR decline with the canicular zone in this particular studies. Based on the grade A evidence from credence trial, the ADA, the living guidelines proposed that the patient with type 2 diabetes with a kidney disease of EGFR more than 30 ml per minute per 1.70 square meter should be considered always for giving a prescription of SGLT2 inhibition, not only to prevent the progression of the chronic kidney disease, but also to decrease the cardiovascular outcomes and both also. The preventing kidney failure is now definitely possible with the SGLT2 inhibitors in people with the type 2 diabetes. And the GFR should be around more than 30. Then we have been doing some studies where more than 30 GFR can be included and before below 30, we are unable to utilize them. And some of these drugs which are established in you know, clinical practice, now we are, they are available in India also. We have been using them uh, frequently. And another drug which we have been using for the past few years is the spironolactone. The spironolactone, the once upon a time, a molecule with an impression of that it's a diuretic, that it has got an established activity in preventing the patients, in treating the patients with congestive heart failure. And simultaneously, the refer it was used in, as a renal protection also, not only in the diabetes, but also in several non-diabetic kidney diseases like IG nephropathy and other glomerular diseases. Not only that, we have part of one major trial internationally called ACHIEVE trial, where the spironolactone will be utilized uh, as a con to control the uh, refractory hypertension in those patients who are on maintenance hemodialysis. This is an ongoing study in our institute and we have been using that. But the only problem, major problem which we see with this particular spironolactone is the hyperkalemia mm -hmm. and sometimes a gynecomasia which is reversible after stopping the drug therapy. But the Bakris, uh, the George Bakris is another reputed, internationally reputed uh, physician and cardiologist and there are several studies attributed to his credit. And the Fenner E says in this particular uh, program is also the professor of medicine and the director of American Heart Association. And he said it's Fenneron is a novel non steroidal selective mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist that shows significantly the antifibrotic and anti inflammatory effects. And in, in a comparative study between, uh, uh, between the spironolactone, epilonone, and phenyronone, this particular drug, phenyronone, had the greatest potency, selectivity, and balanced tissue distribution along with the absence of active metabolites and more major problem which we see routinely in our renal failure patients especially on dialysis despite on dialysis is the hyperkalemia the pre-dialysis hyperkalemia of the particular week the first uh, sample when we take uh, we always worry about the potassium being sometimes 5.8 and more than six or something like that so especially when we want to add a, a Spironolactone to control the refractory hypertension, which we, free, we, see, we see very frequently in our dialysis population. The hyperkalemia is a greater hindrance to our people, uh, which can lead to sudden catastrophe and sudden mortality during dialysis. And he says that this particular Fidelio DKD study said that there's a decree greater than 30% reduction in albuminuria with the phenylalanine as compared to the placebo over a period of 36 months follow up. And 99.9% of participants, participants were on maximally tolerated RAS inhibition simultaneously. So he also says that, that although there was an 18% reduction, risk reduction and 14% reduction in cardiovascular incidence, there was inc incidence of hyperkalemia with MRACs, which resulted in discontinuation of certain cases. But this hyperkalemia is not as prevalent as we see routinely in patients who have been given spironolactone. And these patients with a stage four CKD, can be comfortably given a, a triple therapy that is especially triple therapy involving either ACE inhibitor or ERB and a combination with the spironolactone or plus or minus diuretic and calcium channel blocker and they were also having hyperkalemia uh, definitely this combination triple company combination therapy with the spironolactone has made a difference so that's what uh, these uh, particular new studies uh, established and uh, I close it here and uh, thank you very much for the kind attention and the patience here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It's actually, it's like a, you proved yourself you are a good teacher. 
actually uh, some of my students also uh, when they e, e, this points are useful for me to ask questions to dm students thank you very much now we'll go to the uh, thank you all three speakers uh, dr sashank joshi and dr astra dr sri bhushan raju we will go to question answer session and uh, actually there are so many questions lined up at this point of time uh, first uh, i'll ask uh, the questions to dr sashank joshi thank you very much sir it was so amazing talk as i mentioned so the one of the question they say uh, ask is like even you mentioned like you know, thomas paul idli dosa like you know, so the food food is widely different across india so what will be the main hurdles you face in implementation of in precision nutrition in india sir uh, so dr paul that's a very good question because we all love our food we all love our breakfast lunch and dinner we all love our sweets so you know what happens in precision nutrition is you have to dictate it and in human habits are very difficult to change you really yes, need to change behavior and in a behavioral change mechanism we really need to show them that if you eat two idlis your sugar can go up to 300 and if you just eat one idli with a more sambar which has proteins and you do mix and match it will come to 150 Actually, what happens is that we are able to illustrate to our patients and show them an outcome that the glycemic response to a single idli versus two idlis with a little extra sambar, which means that there is a little fat, little carb. It's all about intensive educating that individual patients and predicting his response and showing that him that response. They will make that auto correction. Our patients are very smart, and today we are in the era. where patients have achieved two two phd's one from google university and one from whatsapp university so they are so smart that independent of us they go on their own and do their own things so it is better that we use technology to ensure that their outcomes are improved but they take some meaningful rational and scientific decisions and precision medicine allows us to use technology with the help of our coaches we have very good coaches we have counselors we have dietitians we have diabetes educators we can efficiently allow them to handhold these people and say that look neither google nor whatsapp is evidence based never has it gone through the rigor of a peer review and therefore this is a precise way of understanding your biology and your cell so if there is one dr thomas paul this is for dr thomas paul for his breakfast for today it is going to be as accurate as that and we'll be able to reasonably predict that this will be a glycemic outcome so this is the big difference this needs time unfortunately many of us are overburdened with work so we can be supervisors on a team which allows using technology with a educator and that's the way forward in this question to dr pk astra uh, uh, so you actually it's very good actually it is uh, very very highlighted the importance of hglt2 inhibitors in a acute setting so what's your experience uh, uh, in covid like you know covid critical care have you continued like somebody that had a severe covid infection and gone into uh, a critical care setting and did you continue sglt2 inhibitor what is your message for that yeah so there are two sets of people who are admitted in the critical care uh, sections one is able to eat smile and uh, cough and uh, urinate properly they, they are in consciousness second some people who are very sick those who are on mcs that means mechanical circulatory support ventilatory support they don't have any choice they have to be on either insulin as i said to make it more convenient affordable attractive solution to our to get a large number of covid patient we have shifted to once in a day glp1 that is lidoglutide okay. and uh, those who are able to take like waiting for 2 3 days once they come out of ventilation they can again reinitiate that one doesn't make much difference but uh, what is the point of giving dapagib project through the rail stew i mean this is the yes. time when not nobody is going to die if you stop dapagib project for 3 days or 4 days but we can add to the problem of uh, if you have bacterial sepsis so waiting 2 3 days withdrawing 2 to 3 days doesn't make any difference but those who are uh, having their own meal and they're in uh, uh, conscious state 
they can be continued without any problem okay so the thank you very much and uh, so the next question to dr raju uh, uh, see thing is in your practice how often are you regularly using in somebody with uh, diabetic kidney disease aglt2 plus arb that uh, is it a standard practice now uh, that's what you recommend see no, that not uh, audible. Uh, how come yeah i'm i'm quite hot. i think it's okay now okay now uh, we have been we've just started recently uh, because we routinely give as inhibitors and arbs and for the control of diabetes mm-hmm. those having a heart disease and uh, having a gfr of more than 30 more than 30 we started using it recently and we did not find any major uh, uh, adverse effect and we have been following them very frequently and regularly and one student is endorsed to see any such kind of a thing uh, happening to this patient as far as the hyperkalemia and other things are concerned but another interesting thing which i i should share with you people is that mm-hmm. we give a prote- uh, renal protection as uh, part of renal protection we give sodium bicarbonate to all of all these people so that might be the one which is uh, uh, which is preventing the pro- uh, occurrence of hyperkalemia in this group of people so sodium bicarbonate is a re- routine and invariably uh, given to each and every patient as a part of renal protection so that can definitely control the hyperkalemia incidence and uh, that will that will not uh, that will not make hyperkalemia major problem in the patient management so uh, this is recently started and though kena i was a part of kenegliflozon just because it is an expensive molecule uh, many of our patients coming to our med- teaching government institution may not be able to afford and good number of patients are being given dapa and we are just seeing the uh, response in them to dr uh, uh, sashank joshi sir what is the evolving role of you mentioned about artificial intelligence so what is the evolving role sir in india for the precision nutrition the india both doctors and um, uh, patients are not very averse to technology so there are two types of doctors one are the people like me who can't handle technology that well for example to even get through this is a challenge for me all these virtual meetings and all. i would love to see dr paul dr murthy my other colleagues one on one have a coffee with them in chennai or something so you know this is the biggest barrier that we are we are having a technophobia but there is a younger generation of both doctors and patients who are techno savvy and they are very very comfortable with the digital space but it is not the technology just a connector technology is the synthesizer in the big picture see the biggest challenge in diabetes today is compliance and adherence and what basically technology enables us is it allows us to illustrate the problem and allows us to auto correct and give a solution to the client or the patient as well as the coach as well as the doctor so the what has happened is in the diabetes space the glucose sensors have allowed us to see the picture even with smbg you can do the same thing provided you use technology so artificial intelligence allows us to predict the glucose variability better gives us a pattern recognition and based on the pattern we can make lifestyle changes whether they are food activity behavior or medications and that is the art of medicine see the art of medicine will always need a doctor at the helm a coach as a vehicle of communication between the expert and the patient so that we are here all committed with two goals one is outcomes which matter and improve lives of people living with diabetes without allowing them to intrude into their private space so it's all about that so i think you know artificial intelligence will come we are seeing this revolution in smartphones just 20 years back we had an ordinary cell phone which was a communication tool where we were talking on the phone nowadays we hardly call up anybody on the phone we think that it's a it's an intrusion in our private space we talk on a whatsapp or a signal or a video call because we are able to get a direct communication now so obviously the technological interface has changed and ai predicts this allows the pattern and then allows decision making for the doctor for the coach and for the patient so that they can have better glycemic outcomes and non glycemic outcomes including cardiovascular outcomes so i think artificial intelligence is here to stay we are on a learning curve let me be very transparent and honest 
and probably it will still be another three to five years be before it, it will be prime time. In the type 1 diabetes space, time in range will be an order of the day and we are able to use it more effectively. People on insulin, we are using technology more effectively to predict the insulin food activity response, to predict hypoglycemias, to predict hyperglycemic peaks. So currently we are using it in a, that little cohort where it matters. But later on, I feel we'll be able to have a larger footprint of artificial intelligence in our lives. So it's already entered our lives through the mobile technology and smartphone technology. It will enter diabetes life soon and endocrine life soon. Thank you very much, uh, sir. And thank you, the uh, Dr. Raju and Dr. Ashra. And I'll just uh, uh, hand over to uh, our course coordinator, uh, Dr. Murthy, senior, uh, uh, senior endocrinologist, my mentor. Over to you, sir. For such no, an you're interactive... Not Yes, Can now you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank yes, sir. You. Thank you all for such an interactive and excellent uh, teaching session. Now, coming to the first talk by Professor Shashank Joshi, when the master and teacher talks, you listen and learn. Eh? The humility which, which he expressed, it intrigues me how he could make such a complex subject so simple, explained with a lot of clarity, a whole lot of terminology and concept introduced and the take home would be probably uh, if I'm right that it's not that you have to have a totally different uh, food pattern. The traditional food someone is used could be modified with many things which Professor Shashank explained to suit the individual. Now coming to the next talk by Professor P.K. Hasra, again the conventional teaching now is a patient in hospital in sick, you stop DAPA. And you know, just like the DAR 19 studies, you could explain that it's not required that in every patient you have to discontinue DAPA who's admitted in hospital, as long as you could closely monitor him, because there is also uh, now um, uh, evidence to show that there may be organ protection and there are very few adverse effects. Now coming to the third talk by Dr. Shri Bhushan Raju on new therapies, for the last two decades, uh, the only standard of care for renal protection was RAS blockade. And uh, fortunately now in the last few years, we have a whole lot of other molecules which have shown benefits as far as kidney. As you explain, HGL2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 antagonist, and also the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist with the newer uh, drug phenylalanine, which, unlike spironolactone, does not cause you know hyperkalemia. And so also you mentioned about the dual blockade with sotaglifosin, and uh, that can also be used in type 1 diabetes. I think overall it's been an excellent session. Thank you all so much. It's been a privilege and pleasure to be part of it. Thank you so much. We will now go on to the second module. And again, we have three very interesting talks and the moderator for this is another legend, Dr. Sanjay Badada. And to introduce Dr. Sanjay Badada, I think that itself will be a symposium by itself. But uh, again, like convention, a simple introduction of him would be, he is a professor and head endocrinology PGM at Chandigarh, chairman elect RSSI Punjab chapter, actually involved in teaching and research founder and current secretary of social support group association of diabetes has contributed very many chapters and textbook and more important our bible he has contributed to the williams textbook of endocrinology 14th edition the parathyroid 4th edition attended various national and international conference and present papers in this conference 
and he continues to be a teacher and he continues to also educate senior alumni of PGI who have already left many years back. Now over to you Dr. Sanjay Badara. the stage is all yours. endocrinologist S.P. Nagesh Diabetes Higher and Endocrine Clinic, Hyderabad, and he received many, many medals. That is, one is S.P. Rao and M.M. Swami Medal for passing MD Part 2 in the first attempt with best distinction. And he is also adjust the best orator at the TAISA uh, meet for his presentation on early insulin initiation in type 2 diabetes. Uh, as well as uh, he is the fellow of the various societies and the on mute dr badara sir dr badara sir you are on mute sir dr sanjay sir you are on mute Uh, could you just uh, go to the panel down below and unmute yourself, sir? There is a panel below the screen. The mic must have been switched off. So if you can just switch on the mic, the green one. Yeah, I'll tell him to. Yeah, yeah. So let me have the privilege let me have the privilege of introducing there's some technology error uh, at Dr. Badada's end, uh, but nevertheless, I would uh, allow him to uh, take over the next uh, speaker introduction. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. V. Srina, uh, who is a DM endocrinologist and is a consultant endocrinologist at Sri Nagesh Diabetes, Thyroid and Endocrine uh, Clinic in Hyderabad. He has major achievements to his credit, uh, very, very young, dynamic, Endocrine Society member. He has achievements including the YR Ready uh, Gold Memorial Award. Uh, he has a medal uh, to that. He has a Swirao and MM Swami medal. The best desertion for the year 2007. 
he has been adjudged as the best orator at uh, Taisa for his presentation on early initi initi initiation of insulin in type 2 diabetes mellitus. He is a fellow of 14th APPES, ISPAD and ESP science schools, Indo 2015 Early Career Forum at San Diego, uh, fellow of the 24th ESD scientist training course at uh, Barcelona uh, in November, also an Anil Shade Award recipient and has 24 peer-reviewed publication and 15 textbook chapters to his credit. May I request uh, Dr. Sri v. Sri Nagesh to uh, uh, speak uh, further. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, am I visible now? In order yeah, to... perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be a part of any program which is headed by such an eminent panel with very senior endocrinologists like uh, Murthy sir, Dr. Thomas Pal sir and uh, Sanjay Vadada sir. And I'd like to compliment the organizers of this program for trying to arrange a program with a difference. For the next 15 minutes, I'm going to focus on a subject in the management of type 2 diabetes, which has not often been touched. It has come into a lot of public attention over the past five to six years, especially in the two Telugu states. We have had a huge number of controversies regarding the fact that many endocrinologists and physicians are not really focusing on prevention of diabetes. We've actually been focusing more on the treatment of diabetes. There have been so many recommendations for a lot of fat diets, many of them which have been based on the keto diets, sometimes with disastrous effects, which has uh, been brought into sharp focus further because of the increased risk of diabetes, which has been seen in with Corona uh, in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, what the lay people are not aware is the fact that we've been doing a huge amount of research in the prevention of diabetes. But unfortunately, these results are not sustainable over the long term because adopting a healthy lifestyle is not all that easy. Second, we've not really been able to get a culturally appropriate diabetes prevention program, at least in the Indian scenario. And it's a fact of life that the majority of the diabetes cases are in Southeast Asia. But most of these diabetes prevention programs have been done in the West. And it is, as I'm going to go delve further into my talk, it will come as a very pleasant surprise to you that we now have large scale Indian peer moderated diabetes prevention studies, which have given very good results. This is what I'm going to speak about, what we have been doing for the prevention of diabetes, how we can bring technology into the prevention of diabetes, how successful are we, what do we need to do better? And do we really need to go for all these fat diets or keto diets? And lastly, this talk will emphasize on three particular areas. The first one is the prevention of type 2 diabetes. We are going to have some discussion on gestational diabetes. A little bit of focus on technology. A lot of the technology part has already been dealt with by Shashank Joshi sir. But I'm going to briefly touch upon it in the aspect of prevention. And maybe a small note at prevention of type 1 diabetes, which was not an initial part of the program. But with the recent focus on tocilizumab, which has been rejected by ADA for the prevention of type 1 diabetes, I thought probably we should touch upon that briefly. And most of my talk has been from the abstracts of the ADA session because the endeavor is to bring about, bring to you what has been discussed in the ADA sessions as far as the prevention of diabetes is concerned. So to set things off, I'm going to speak first give you a brief overview of this, what was known as the Norfolk Diabetes Prevention Study, which was a study done by Professor Mike Sampson. This was a very large study which was funded by the UK NHIR. Almost 150,000 people were screened and out of this 150,000 people, they were divided into three groups. At the end of the day, you picked out around 1,028 people. There were a few particular features with this study which were specific to Norfolk Diabetes Prevention Study which had not been done with the earlier studies. Most of the earlier studies had actually focused on people with impaired glucose tolerance, raised postprandial blood glucose levels. The Norfolk study actually divided people into three groups. One, people with without diabetes who were in the second group, people who had an impaired fasting glucose and contrary to what is seen with the other recommendations, their definition of impaired fasting glucose were people who had a blood glucose level more than 110 and a blood glucose level who had uh, which was between which was less than 126. The traditional diet definition of IFG is 100 to 125, but in this study it was 110 to 125. 
and they had another group non glycemic high risk diabetes group those who had an hb1c between 5.7 to 6.49 and a fasting blood glucose less than 110 we actually did not have an impaired uh, blood glucose group in this particular study and then these people were then randomized into three groups one was a control group one was a group where we had a standard intervention and the third group was where we had a standard intervention along with a volunteer group which emphasized the advice of the standard intervention group and they were known as the diabetes prevention mentors so this was what they wanted to see whether addition of this diabetes prevention mentors could add anything extra to the diabetes prevention study what they actually found out at the end of the day was when compared to the control group the ones with the standard intervention as well as the ones with the standard intervention plus the diabetes prevention mentor had a 47% reduction in the risk of progressing to diabetes many of them actually regressed to normal glycemia and a lot of these people had a weight loss which was approximately in the neighborhood of 3 kilos so what this actually translated to do was that it reiterated and reemphasized what has been seen in the other diabetes prevention studies you go in for a lifestyle and exercise of almost 150 minutes per week you go into a diet which is pretty similar to what you'd see with the mediterranean diet cut down on your saturated fat lower your carbohydrate content lose your weight of up to 3 kilos it reduces your risk of diabetes a lot of these people can regress back to normal glycemia and what they actually found out in addition was that this diabetes prevention mentors did not add anything much to what had already been done by the standard intervention group their the conclusion of dr samson was that these people perhaps in the adult group were not very useful but in the younger children and the youth who have less motivation the dpms could probably play an important role coming to the final outcomes of the study i had one observation i had a couple of observations the first observation was this reflects what has been seen by a majority of us in the other uh, recent app mediated uh, diabetes control programs a lot of this app mediated and digital based diabetes control programs put these patients on 2 to 3 months of very strict diet and lifestyle a lot of them go off their medications they regress to normal glycemia and this has been considered a case of diabetes reversal but we have to understand that what has been emphasized by the norfolk study is that it is a short term regression to normal glycemia the challenge is not in getting to a short term regression in normal glycemia the challenge is in maintaining this weight loss motivating people to continue this physical activity and eventually ending up with long term normal glycemia and unfortunately that has not been seen in a lot of studies this is our biggest challenge as far as diabetes prevention is concerned and if you are a part of such a diabetes reversal program and you achieved what you would consider a diabetes reversal don't rejoice too soon because maintaining it in the long term is the difficult part the second critic of this norfolk diabetes prevention study was that it essentially looked at people with impaired fasting glucose and not at people with impaired glucose tolerance as has been seen by a lot of us most of the diabetes studies have actually looked at igt and we've had good uh, outcomes in people with igt as far as diabetes prevention and prevention of uh, progression to further and worse diabetes is concerned but unfortunately that has not really been replicated in the norfolk study and their definitions of what constitutes ifg and what constitutes a normal glycemic high risk group is a bit sketchy so we need more people further definition and more long term data before we can really conclude that this norfolk diabetes prevention study gave us something really concrete coming to the next section of the ada talks we had one talk can we prevent type 2 diabetes in women who have gestational diabetes this was essentially based on a meta analysis of 20 studies which involved almost 250 women what all of us know is that women with gestational diabetes have greater risk of progressing to type 2 diabetes almost 10 times greater risk as is seen in the normal population this particular group has been seen by almost all of us and they have an almost 40 to 80% risk of recurrence of gdm in the next pregnancy it's almost considered de rigueur that if you have had gdm in one pregnancy you are likely to have a gdm in the second pregnancy and most of the data which was actually mentioned in the study was obtained from the nurses health study because the nurses presented a group of people who have who are easy to monitor and who are likely to be followed up for a longer period of time and in this particular group all those nurses who had in healthcare professionals who had a gdm when they were started on 100 minutes of physical activity 
per week, approximately 100 minutes of physical activity per week, as little as 100 minutes. There was a 9% reduction, lower risk for type 2 diabetes after gestational diabetes. And if this 100 minutes of exercise was increased to 150 minutes of exercise per week, there was a 47% lower risk of progression to type 2 diabetes. What it actually tells us is, once we have a woman who has come to us in the OP with GDM, they go for delivery and then they don't follow up with us again. They just come back to us again only after they've developed type 2 diabetes or they have a second pregnancy and they've again had a recurrence of GDM. We do keep emphasizing to them, we do keep telling them that you are at risk of diabetes. You need to buck up after your pregnancy. But unfortunately, this message is not translated to the gynecologists. This message is not translated to the pediatricians. If we can succeed in creating in them an awareness about the risk of future type 2 diabetes, and if we create in them a perception that they are overweight and they need to do something about their weight. In all these studies, when women were perceived that they were overweight, there was more motivation to indulge in more exercise and in, in having a more controlled diet. The other part where we actually fail in a lot of our patients is in telling them that after they have delivered, that is not the end of GDM. GDM does not disappear automatically after you have delivered. You have to continue screening yourself. And if you are screened, at six weeks and three months after delivery and at least every six months subsequently and you find out that you have elevated blood glucose levels contact your doctor start your lifestyle changes unfortunately these three messages are never brought across to these people and this is what acog the american college of gynecologists has been telling their patients and their gynecologists repeatedly make sure that the patients receive appropriate information refer them for testing wherever required send them or refer them to the appropriate specialist and also recommend weight loss. Unfortunately, in a country like India, we have a huge amount of family pressure. Everybody gives you advice except the doctor. And pregnancy is considered a state of nutritional deprivation. And once you deliver, irrespective of your glycemic status, there is a tendency towards giving them uh, tendency to overeat, give them more calorie dense and give them less nutrient dense food. And unfortunately, this is what pushes them from the border of pre-diabetes to diabetes. And that is the point where the recent studies and this particular study have uh, emphasized on a point known as care coordination. There are multiple definitions for care coordination, but in the long term, what care coordination actually means is it synchronizes the delivery of a patient across various healthcare providers and specialists. I'll give you a typical example. You have a woman with GDM. She has come to you for control of diabetes. She goes back to the gynecologist she delivers the problem she is going to face after this are she might continue to have diabetes after delivery she might have an infant with gestational diabetes who has infant of a diabetic mother who presents with hypoglycemia in the first three days of life who is shifted to the pediatrician and consequently this woman does not breastfeed which again increases the risk of a gestational diabetes what this care coordination actually does is it coordinates between you and the gynecologist you tell the gynecologist to test the patient for diabetes after pregnancy, keep on monitoring her, coordinates between you and the pediatrician and the gynecologist. You tell the pediatrician that he has to monitor the child for hypoglycemia. You tell the pediatrician that this mother has to breastfeed irrespective of her current status and irrespective of the status of her child. Except if he's having seizures, it is always mandatory to institute breastfeeding because if you don't breastfeed in the first three days of life, it's very unlikely that you're going to continue breastfeeding later on. And also coordinate between the three specialists here, the nutrition and the dietitianist and the exercise specialist so that we continue this care program even after the woman is delivered. And one important yeah, aspect. Two more, two more more Dr. And one other aspect which people focused about was doing this kind of activities in a country like India. We had two programs, the most important of which was the Kerala Diabetes Prevention Program which had which was a program which was tailored for an ethnically appropriate population group where you had small group sessions which were led by peers one session approximately every week followed by a couple of expert sessions and what was significant to this particular uh, intervention program was that you had a coordination between the community the peer group as well as the expert which is most important for a support pro for ensuring that you have a long-term diabetes prevention program. The second program which we had was the SMART 2D program, which had again had a peer support program, 
and a care companion. This was a program which was carried out in Africa, Eastern Asia and parts of India. And both these programs actually said that when you had an ethnic fit, diabetes prevention programs were could be carried out in people in India also or in countries which have uh, lesser resources but greater prevalence of diabetes. Coming to the technology part, I'm going to heart, I'm not going to speak more about it because that has already been uh, emphasized well by Dr. Shashan Joshi sir. But what I'll tell you is, like sir has said, WhatsApp, apps, messages have become very important in the monitoring of diabetes. The single largest program problem we had in monitoring our patient in uh, following up our patients was the fact that they were not reachable. Transport has become a problem and especially in the setting of the lockdown and the digital communication, this is no longer a problem now. We can reach out to our patients, we can monitor them, we can have support groups also on WhatsApp, we can have uh, messages going on back and forth between you and the patient which you can answer at your leisure and this is technology has actually made reaching out to your patients a lot more easier even though it also comes out with its own different problems. And lastly, one little note on the recent tocilizumab issue. In people who are at risk of diabetes and who have already started who are already on the path to type 1 diabetes or have been recently diagnosed with diabetes. There were a few studies which actually looked at the immunomodulator, uh, the monoclonal antibody tocilizumab, which actually reduced the beta cell destruction by the autoimmune diabetes mediated activity. And in case you had people who were going to progress to diabetes, it could delay the progression of diabetes. And in people who have already been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, tocilizumab was actually found out to reduce the beta cell destruction. If possible, obviate the need for insulin therapy or at least reduce their insulin requirements and subsequently tocilizumab was brought up before FDA for approval. In a surprising move, FDA voted not to allow tocilizumab into general use for the prevention of diabetes at this point of time by a matter of I think one or two votes. But they are still, they have still gone back to FDA. FDA has not given any particular reason why they have rejected tocilizumab. They have again gone back to the drawing board. I think we are going to come up with a few more answers a couple of uh, months down the line and in, in a couple of years we all all these days we've been speaking only about prevention of type 1 diabetes uh, of type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes but speaking about prevention of type 1 diabetes might also be a reality very soon and that's it and thanks a lot for the opportunity thank you very much it was an excellent talk and uh, indeed it is a different format is classical of the PPT presentation is extempore and very nice. Uh, so we can take question and answer session uh, after the uh, third talk. So we will move on to the next talk and the next talk uh, is delivered by Dr. Somitra Kumar. He is a consultant cardiologist at Fortis Hospital, Kolkata and chief coordinator uh, academic services cardiology and is uh, he is 155 publications to his credit that uh, speaks about his research aptitude. He is past honorary secretary of the CSI National and West Bengal branch. He is past president of Indian Academy of Echocardiography as well as past president of West Bengal Academy of Echocardiography. And Dr. Somitra Kumar is going to talk on update on the SCORD and SOLICIS trial, cardiovascular and kidney outcome. So I am very eager to here, Dr. Uh, Somitra Kumar on the very, very interesting topic that is with relation to SOTA closing. Over to Dr. Kumar. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Varada, for the kind introduction and thank you, the organizers, for this invitation to be part of this ADA 2021 scientific sessions review on Indian perspective. So, as you have heard, I've been asked to speak on the uh, Solvis WHF and SCORED trial updates. Uh, first, I'll take up the Solvis WHF and then move on to the SCORED trial. Uh, and then a pooled analysis of the two and then of course the key home, uh, I mean uh, key take home messages. So first talking about the Solvis WHF trial. Uh, this was the effect of sotaglyphosine on cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes post worsening uh, heart failure. So the goal was to assess the uh, safety and efficacy of sotaglyphosine in reducing cardiovascular events with type 2 diabetes and recent heart failure hospitalization and eligible patients were randomized one is to one uh, between 
sota glyphosin starting with 200 mg per day and then moving on to 400 mg versus placebo and uh, the drug was very importantly initiated uh, just before discharge or within three days after discharge so total number of enrollees were one two 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 and uh, duration of median follow-up was nine months and you must all be aware that this trial was cut short because of lack of funding uh, in view of the ongoing COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, so the mean age was quite elderly and uh, 69 years and 34% were females. Inclusion criteria was heart failure following stabilization with diuretics and uh, the antiprobian P was 600 picogram per ml in sinus rhythm and more than 1800 picogram per ml if there was atrial fibrillation and of course the patient needed to be a type 2 diabetes. An exclusion criteria was end stage heart failure, recent history of ACS or any recent revascularization and EGFR of course had to be uh, uh, more than 30 because less than 30 was an exclusion criteria. And uh, mean EGFR was uh, about in the lower range, 35%, but mind you, as many as 21% had a EF, uh, more than 50%. Uh, EGFR mean median was 50 ml per minute, uh, uh, glycated hemoglobin 7.2, and uh, RAS blockers were received by 92%, metformin by 52%. So what were the principal findings? The trial was prematurely stopped. As I just told you, the primary endpoint of total CV death, heart failure hospitalization, and urgent visit for heart, fa heart failure hospitalization for sota glyphosin versus placebo was 70 versus 98 events per 100 patient years. So this means a, a relative risk reduction of 33% with a very, very significant p value. And what was even more significant that this was achieved within 28 days of follow-up. The secondary outcomes were total CV death and hospitalization for heart failure. And again, a very significant p-value and a significant event reduction. And then the first CV death and hospitalization for heart failure, uh, again, a significant p-value. CV event in isolation was not significant on the pooled intention to treat analysis, but it was uh, significant on on treatment analysis. There was an improvement in quality of life as assessed by the KCSQ score, and uh, the changes in EGFR was not significant. The significant side effects were diarrhea, of course, uh, genital mycotic infections, and uh, some increased strain towards severe hypoglycemia. So overall. What was important that this was the trial which showed that it can be initiated early, the drug sotaglyphosin. It leads to improvement both in HEPREF and HEPREF patients. Uh, and we will come back to this uh, more when the key uh, take home points are discussed. Now I will pass on to the score rate trial. Uh, so this was the effect of sotaglyphosin on cardiovascular and renal events in type 2 diabetes uh, and moderate renal impairment who are at cardiovascular risk. So again, uh, this was uh, one, one, one is to one randomization uh, to sotaglyphosin starting with 200 milligram, then 400 milligram and moving, uh, I mean, versus placebo. And uh, this was a much larger trial. Total number of enrollees was 10,500 plus. Um, duration of follow-up was also 24 months. Um, again, an elderly age group of population, 69 years, and a higher percentage of females, 45%. Inclusion criteria, type 2 diabetes, of course, the EGFR criteria was 25 to 60 ml per minute, and uh, patients also, need, also needed to have at least one major risk, cardiovascular risk factor if they were aged more than 18 years or at least two minor risk factors if they are aged more than equal to 55 years. Any planned use of SGLT2 inhibitor was an exclusion criteria. Most of the patients in score rate had uh, preserved ejection fraction in the range of 60%. Uh, median EGFR was 44.4. The higher uh, glycated hemoglobin compared to the Solvice trial, 8.3%. Uh, the median 
urinary albumin creatine ratio was 75 uh, milligram per gram, 88% on a RAS blocker and 55% was on a, a metformin. So what were the principal findings? Uh, the trial was again prematurely stopped like soloist and uh, the primary endpoint initially uh, was major adverse cardiovascular events, namely CV death, MI or uh, non-fatal stroke, but it was changed to uh, CV death, heart failure hospitalization or urgent visit for heart failure hospitalization. So again, there was a significant 26% relative risk reduction, very significant p-value. Uh, the This was achieved uh, slightly later compared to Solovis, but nevertheless, it was achieved within 95 days of follow-up. And in terms of the original co-primary endpoint, Again, the p-value was significant. There was a 16% relative risk reduction and the p-value was just significant for the composite mace of CV death, uh, heart failure, I mean, MI and non-fatal stroke. And what was more important is that uh, this uh, uh, decrease in mace was largely because of decrease in myocardial infarction and non-fatal stroke which, was, which has not been explicitly shown by the earlier SGLT2 trials. The secondary trials, as far as CV death in isolation is concerned, it was not significant. Neither was the change in renal parameters, probably because the study was cut short because of lack of funding. Now I will go to the pooled analysis of the two trials, which is also very significant. So overall, if you consider the two trials together, Solvist and the score rate, you see the total CV death, heart failure hospitalization and urgent heart failure visit was uh, very, very significantly reduced uh, when the two trial populations were put together. And this uh, benefit was seen across all ranges of LV ejection fraction, starting from less than 40%. In the mid-range ejection fraction, that is 40 to 50 percent, and very surprisingly, the best benefit was in the group which had ejection fraction more than 50 percent. So these days we are raving about the results of Emperor Preserved, but actually the path was shown much earlier by the results of this pooled analysis of scored and Solvist in terms of benefit in HEPPEF patients. So what are the key take home messages I will try to summarize uh, for your benefit. So the key take home messages that it was uh, this sotaglyphosin, which as you know, is a unique SGLT2 because it has significant SGLT1 inhibition as well. So uh, it, it was shown to be effective not only in hep -ref patients, but also in hep -pep patients and irrespective of the past history of heart failure. And uh, this substantiates uh, not only the data of DAPA heart failure and Emperor reduced trials in HEPREF, but was a forerunner of the Emperor Preserve trials, which has been uh, just uh, presented with the initial top line results and is going to be presented in ESC 2021. Number two point, it can be started pre-discharge or shortly after discharge within uh, three days of discharge, in fact. The third point, uh, there was significant decrease in the original co-primary endpoint of CV mortality, MI, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. And this was largely driven by reduction in non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke, which has not been explicitly shown by any SGLT2 inhibitors in the mega trials conducted with them. Number four, by virtue of SGLT1 inhibition, Sotaglyphosin can lower blood glucose even in patients with CKD at least up to a EGFR of 25 ml per minute with low rates of hypoglycemia. Number five, whether combined SGLT1 or SGLT2 inhibition has some age over SGLT2 inhibition uh, alone remains to be seen. We must remember that SGLT1 receptors are not only expressed in the gut but also in the a late part of the proximal renal tubules and very importantly in the heart, in the capillaries. So uh, the initial animal studies have shown that SGLT2, SGLT1 inhibition can lead to less of glycogen storage in myocardial cell and less damage to reactive oxygen species. So this is an emerging area of interest where SGLT1 inhibition can uh, lead to 
uh, greater benefits over SGL2, SGLT2 inhibition alone. And the last point, unlike other SGLT2 uh, trials, significant uh, decrease in renal endpoints were not seen in the SCORE trial. But the point to be noted is that uh, that again was because of the premature termination. But early EGFR changes that were seen in the sotaglifosin uh, uh, are similar to those that are seen with RAS blockers and with the other SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, sotaglifosin, I think, has shown some unique results in terms of uh, at least cardiac protection to start with in irrespective of past history of heart failure in both HEPREF and HEPPEF. It can be effective as a hypoglycemic drug. Of course, this benefit in heart failure remains uh, uh, for sotaglifosin limited to type 2 diabetic patients because the trial design did not include non-diabetic patients as we have seen in DAPA heart failure and emperor reduced and preserved. But uh, uh, I mean, if conducted in uh, non-diabetic patients, we have, will have to wait and see whether it extends its benefit in non-diabetic patients as well. And in diabetic patients, it can be effective as a hypoglycemic drug as well uh, because it lowers blood glucose at least up to EGFR of 25. So with that, I conclude my presentation and I'll be happy to take part in the question answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, finishing very much in time and highlighting the both these trials uh, with the SOTA glyphlosin. Indeed, the so, glyphlosins are the most sought, most sorted drugs in this recent time, whether it is an endocrinologist, whether it is a nephrologist, whether it is a cardiologist, more and more people are involved. We will take question answer at the end presentation of the end of the next talk. So now we can move on to the third uh, presentation of this uh, second module of today's program. And for this today's program, we have a speaker, Dr. Mukesh Shiti. Dr. Mukesh Shiti is MD, DNB Medicine and DNB Nephrology. He is consultant nephrologist at Jupiter Lifetime Hospital, Thane, Mumbai. He is founder of Kamaya Kidney Care, a dialysis network company at Thane. He is founder of Naunath Healthcare as well as member and trustee of Imaging Foundation 2012. He has more than 100 publications to his credit and that includes abstracts and national and international journals. And most interestingly, is he performed more than 250 kidney transplantation. And he's uh, one of the founder member of Apex Kidney Care Private Limited, which is considered the biggest dialysis network company of the uh, area of the India indeed. So uh, with this uh, very uh, attractive background, uh, attractive CV, I'll invite Dr. Mukesh Hite to speak on uh, the translating diabetes and kidney disease clinical trial findings with the clinical practice. So over to Dr. Shite. Uh, kind introduction and uh, basically the topic is translating our clinical finding into clinical practice but let me give a small uh, background of diabetic kidney disease so when you talk about diabetic kidney disease there is a triad of hyperfiltration microalbuminuria and hypertension you know, they, these are the three things which are most important in controlling the uh, growth of kidney disease or progression of kidney disease what is the background? What is the, the hyperfiltration concept? So when you have diabetes, the glucose goes up, there is advanced glycation end product by polyol pathway or by hexose kinase or various pathways like protein kinase, etc. Ultimately, these end products act on the glomeruli, give rise to mesangial expansion. Then those end products also result into endothelial damage and the endothelial damage results into microalbuminuria. Then there are structural changes like mesangial hypertrophy and globular basement membrane thickening. So if this is the background, we know that if we are able to minimize hyperfiltration, you are likely to minimize the kidney damage. And the endothelial damage goes hand in hand with these structural changes. And that results into microalbuminuria, which is not only present in the glomerular vessels, but also in the coronaries, also in the cerebrovascular disease. And that's why we always say, Chronic kidney disease goes hand in hand with cardiovascular disease. And in fact, sometimes mortality of chronic kidney disease is often due to cardiovascular disease. 
Now, once the structural changes occurs, we have renal hypertension. The intraglomerular sclerosis results into activation of renin angiotensin axis, and that results into in initially intraglomerular hypertension and later on even the systemic hypertension. And that, in fact, takes a toll on the other target organ damage. So, if this is the trial, microalbuminuria, structural changes, and the genesis of hypertension, then it makes it worth to control these three so that you are likely to prevent the progression of renal disease. In fact, this, this theme was taken up in this uh, 81st session of uh, Scientific Forum of ADA 2021, and where one of the very prominent speaker, Dr. Mariam Alfakaran, he, she says that uh, how much should be the control of blood pressure to really prevent the renal damage. And various figures came up like 135, 85 is nice enough to basically prevent the further damage. And 125, 85 could also be. So what has been the study part of it is that uh, lesser the better. But if you have proteinuria as per MDRD study, then your blood pressure target should be around 125 by 75. And if there is no proteinuria, then 135 by 85 blood pressure is good enough. As soon as you prevent hypertension or control blood pressure, its translation into intraglomerular pressure goes down. So intraglomerular hypertension comes down, proteinuria comes down. And protein is a toxin. Once proteins are leaked across the glomerular capillary, it is going to induce tubular damage, tubular interstitial damage, tubular interstitial fibrosis, and then typical progressive global glomerular sclerosis, all those chemicals from Winston bodies and diabetic glomerular sclerosis. So protein is the root cause. If you control blood pressure, your intraglomerular pressure comes down and the protein area comes down and that is the utility. And now we know that the best weapon to control this is your ACE inhibitor and ARBs. And that's how most of the studies which were done in the past, like renal study, hot spot study, all those studies have shown that yes, it basically helps in controlling the renal damage by reducing blood pressure, by reducing protein urea. Now the question came that if you are able to get benefits, then why don't you get maximum benefit by combining ACE inhibitor with ARB? But then CALM study was the only study which showed that there could be a beneficial effect of combining ARBs with ACE inhibitor. But then on target study, altitude study, one nephron D study, all of them have showed that no, if you combine the two, then you are likely to create more hyperkalemia, more hypotension and progressive renal damage. So now it's a well understood thought that we do not combine two blockers of the same axis, that is ACE inhibitor or ARB. So initially we are focused on renin angiotensin axis, but the fourth player was almost you know, not, not considered, that was aldosterone. And now there is a lot of light thrown on aldosterone that aldosterone is a toxin. It is causing vascular toxicity. It causes progressive fibrosis in the renal glomeruli. It improves the uh, COX-2 end products, and that is again further damaging and improves the, rather uh, takes away the tone of the vessels, afferent and efferent arteriole. So it's worth blocking aldosterone. So initially, of course, we were using spinalactone, then aprenonone, and now there's a lot of light on finronone. So what is the difference between two? Are, are there any class differences between these drugs? You will find finronone, which is of course a new addition to this uh, MAR, the mineralocorticoid uh, receptor antagonist, is that it is very tissue specific. There is an equal distribution of receptors for finronone in heart and kidney. So say we consider 100% uh, receptors, 50 would be in kidney, 50 would be in the heart. While when you talk about spinalactone or epirinone, there is almost 90% receptors in the kidney and 10% in the heart. And that's why they say that finronone is a good cardio safety drug because it has a preferential action. And because it is equal action on kidney, the risk of hyperkalemia is less with finronone. It is not that seen with uh, spinalactone or epirinone because two third receptors are actually situated in the kidney. So when you give 50 mg of spinalactone, it is going to act more on the kidney then less on the heart. So benefits on the heart are reduced than the kidney and risk of hyperkalemia would be more. So this was all highlighted by a, a study which was presented in ADA and that was by Jardians that he said that yes, there is a utility of RAS blockers, there is a utility of uh, mineral called receptor antagonist. And now everyone is speaking about HGLT2 inhibitor. And of course, that's a wonder, wonder drug for our diabetic nephropathy patient as well. In fact, if you see the progress of diabetic nephropathy that initially there is hyperfiltration which is so silent it is not recordable your if you calculate gfr it will be higher than normal because it is hyperfiltration slowly this hyperfiltration changes into normal filtration but by then already structural changes are already made 
and by the time you get diabetic nephropathy say early proteinuria many years are already lapsed so the worry is that as a nephrologist we see those patients only when the uh, stage dkd is of 2 or 3 or maybe higher than that or sometimes they come only when there is end stage liver disease if there is really a preventive program to be planned then it has to be in the stage of hyperfiltration and rather there is only one drug which probably would be able to prevent hyperfiltration and that is this sglt2 inhibitor because they are absolutely neutralizing the actual glomerular effect what you see in the pathogenesis of early onset diabetic nephropathy that the basic concept is known that if sodium and glucose is not absorbed it is not allowed to get absorbed in the proximal tubule it will get delivered into the macula densa macula densa would in fact now neutralize the afferent arterial tone by constricting it that is it will neutralize the effect of adenosine on the afferent arterial as soon as afferent arterial is constricted you will not have hyperfiltration often there is efferent arterial dilatation so the intraglomerular pressure drops and all those cascade of events like uh, microalbuminuria changes which are structural and my uh, intraglomerular hypertension all that would be negated neutralized and that is why we say sglt2 inhibitor acts at very primary pathophysiological level of diabetic nephropathy and that's why it, it is getting a lot of emphasis now newer and newer uh, trials are coming but credence the mprh and the dapa security trials have already proved that the end points that is the onset of end stage kidney disease reduction of gfr less than 50% of baseline reduction of protein urea and overall retarding the progression of ckd all those beneficial effects were seen in all these trials so it is proved that sglt2 inhibitor is the wonder drug for diabetic nephropathy and that's how our major emphasis is now on asnarbs maybe fenronor because it has to offer the cardiovascular safety as well and less risk of hyperkalemia and then sglt2 inhibitors of any type this basically are the three weapons in trying to prevent the diabetic nephropathy the uh, one aspect of our talk was that how you convert this clinical trials into the actual clinical practice and the a major presentation this time in the area 2021 was mainly on this uh, trial that we have uh, many such uh, methods of presenting data for the diabetic nephropathy the demographic data and in fact all these they are called as drtcs that is diabetic research and training centers and almost every city in us has been participating creating the data and it was established way back in 1977 that means already 50 years have gone they are already presenting several data that where we lack we know the theory we know how are the pathogenesis involved into diabetic nephropathy why it is not translated into the clinical practice so that we don't see the results we have not yet seen the reduction in diabetic nephropathy cases we have not seen the good control of diabetes as everyone spoke Uh, even dr sharma spoke about the nutritional aspect of it that is not been translated into the actual practice so despite knowing theory where we lack that so that we don't see that into clinical practice and we are not able to see those reduction of cases so a lot of uh, concept came that initially our approach was healthcare related no let us create a team for diabetic management let us uh, say empower or all doctors in the form of general practitioner physicians primary healthcare workers or even healthcare assistants nurses ward boy and when we realize that even doing so we are not getting the net result so now the focus has been shifted from not only empower the healthcare worker but also empower the patient you know the direct patients who are actually victims of this disease because they are the one who are likely to be able to take care of their own disease if they have been taught well so now there is a lot of research going on in talking with patients directly empower them by understanding how to monitor glucose how to identify risk of hypoglycemia how to basically take your you know weight into control what are the methods you will achieve there was one very good uh, study conducted in us where they in fact selected churches and all the patients walking in they just could view that who are the obese and you no know, overweight individuals and they were isolated and they are given this uh, paradigm program that you maintain your weight and that would help in controlling your diabetes and they did so versus there was a control and they found out that over a period of one year all those patients enrolled into this trial could lose their weight and maintain their weight over a period of one year but those who were in control group could not do so and that's how it it is worth reaching to patient talking about the basics of uh, lifestyle management as well as the uh, control of diabetes and control of weight especially and see the results and then they were taught to teach the same to their neighborhood similar patients so it's like patients spreading the knowledge to patients and this was found to be very effective in uh, reaching to the actual end users 
and this the concept of translating your clinical findings into clinical practice has been at two levels you know, the first level is it is basically called as bench to the bed you know that means you are actually at a bench learning these things uh, from various you know uh, webinars we are also learning this from conferences there are many material which which we still talk to us but how to reach to the bed that is where the actual patient is lying so bench to bed this was called as translation level 1 and this basically comprises of uh, you know talking to patients enrolling them so that the end patient is utilized this is mainly at a basic level of diabetes and is so called systemic complications or progression of diabetes related microvascular or microvascular changes control of diabetes how it helps to uh, safeguarding the variety of organs so that is at a primary level but once you already have a target organ involvement like you have a diabetes with chronic kidney disease then naturally it's called as translation level 2 and that was called as clinic to community so translation level 2 is clinic to community that you are seeing handful of patient into your clinic and you have a knowledge and that's how you can impart to patients and treat your cohort of patients well but what about what is happening in community there are hundreds of patients not even able to reach to the treatment level there are villages and small cities where probably there is no enough super specialty departments and that is how uh, the task naturally comes to general practitioners as well as physicians where they have to not only learn this and extrapolate to community and that probably would require lot of funding lot of manpower and we probably at a level where we need to upgrade this translation level 2 because only then probably our trials and learning from clinical trials will translate to the end user and into the field of practice where we'll be able to alter the changes in the form of either minimizing the complications of the organ damage or at least preventing the so called faster progression and then overall creating benefit to the community i stop here and i'll be open to the questions later thank you dr mukesh for uh, finishing very much in time rather uh, one minute before your time and very nice presentation and very clear information that uh, how you can utilize the knowledge obtained from clinical practice to the uh, to the community level so i'll invite all the uh, three speakers and the chief moderator for the discussion for the second module uh for top and this so it was a one of the most difficult thing because uh, everybody wants to reversal of the diabetes and but it is very difficult so i have a question for you dr nagesh is that in indian setting in indian setting what is the most important challenge you see to reverse the diabetes and what is the options you have sir as far as reversal of diabetes is concerned the largest challenge here uh, the largest challenge i would face are expectations you cannot have a situation where you have somebody who comes in with a blood glucose of 320 fasting and post prandial of 400 coming in and telling you that i want to go on a keto diet and reverse my diabetes in 2 days that's just not going to happen we have to strike a balance medication is not something which is toxic or going to kill you start medication institute lifestyle changes continue your changes bring down your blood glucose levels and try to slowly go off medication this has to be the way things are we cannot have drastic measures in management of diabetes but most of our patients are not willing to listen to this acceptance is the biggest challenge i would face so uh, dr nagesh actually you are very correct man i was just looking at some of the data that over a period of time how we have changed like the sugar intake pre sugar intake in 1960 was 5 kg per year per person and it is in 2015 this 17 kg per year per person Yes. And if we go looking at the prevalence of diabetes, actually it goes hand in hand with the sugar intake. So what I believe is probably one of the very very important thing what we can do is to change the social structure. Like we are seeing ad on the TV that kuch mitha ho jaye, something like that. What is this? Actually, these kind of things are deteriorating the situation more and more, especially with relation to diabetes. Yes. Sir. And we see every occasion is celebrated with the sweets. Sir. so whether you are pass your md whether you are pass your dm whether you are marrying whether you are engagement everywhere the sweets are there and the sweets are distributed like anything 
and yes. that may be one of the probably very very important step to take care before entry into the pre diabetes and maybe low hanging fruit should be pick up fast those having strong family history those are obese and all like this my second question related to uh, gdm is that uh, rather a comment actually probably gdm is one of the lowest hanging fruit to catch them because you are probably taking care of the two persons at a one time one is yes, the gdm mother and other is the gdm offspring of the gdm baby so that is there yes sir any question from other panelist or the uh, murti sir with relation to diet and uh, diabetes challenge no okay nothing i will summarize okay thank you sir so uh, now my uh, regarding to the second talk with dr uh, kumar and uh, as i already mentioned this uh, sg2 uh, sglt2s are actually the most sought after the drugs in the medical fraternity and uh, in opds now we see that our uh, probably nephrologists and cardiologists are prescribing more sglt2 inhibitors rather than the endocrinologist the reasons are many that uh, recently we see a patient of catecholamine induced cardiomyopathy our cardiologist after us to prescribe dapagliflozin to improve the uh injection fraction so we requested them sir pheochromocytoma is a state of volume contraction and the dapagliflozin is going to do the volume contraction because it acts as a diuretic so of course it is a very very important drug coming in various ways but may not be fit for everywhere and as you mentioned that is a teller med and uh, i have a question related to the sotagliflozin do you have any idea uh, that is going to come into the indian market dr kumar no i am not so sure uh, i mean uh, as i mean uh, uh, as far as i am concerned i have no insights into this uh, it is a drug uh, which is approved uh, in europe uh, for use in uh, type 1 diabetes along with insulin that's what i know and fda has approved it for use uh, as a anti diabetic drug in type 2 diabetes but has withheld it uh, approval for type use in type 1 diabetes that's all i know and uh, whether it is going to be approved for uh, use in type 2 diabetes especially at risk of developing heart failure in this country uh, whether someone has approached the dcgi i am not aware if you have okay. some any other is having some information can please share uh so well at least in type 1 diabetes i for our audience and the uh, because we should not be very aggressive and propagating this thing because we have already lot of people treating type 1 diabetes with herbs treating type 2 diabetes, diabetes oral drugs and their patients are lending to us in the diabetic ketoacidosis and these gliflozins are known to cause diabetic ketoacidosis so probably in type 1 diabetes we should be very very cautious because uh, and already this drug is causing dk that may be okay for the western countries of people are well aware that how to manage or how to reach to quickly to the hospital while here is situation may be totally different but yes that is a very another addition to the armamentarium for the heart failure and the cardio protective action especially with the Uh, uh related to the diabetes and otherwise also so now i'll move on to the third talk the question uh, i have for uh, dr mukesh ite is that you said that uh, uh loss of gfr is a, a, a late stage event in the dkd progression right i agree with that uh, but the another question i have very naive question is that we diagnose microalbuminuria not on a single measurement we do diagnose microalbuminuria with a gap of 3 to 6 months you repeat and show it that there is albumin excretion is increased is it a correct strategy or now any modification in this strategy or is there need of modification in this strategy yeah so basically uh, for the diagnosis purpose we require two readings taken at an interval of 3 months where you demonstrate uh, twice consistency of this microalbuminuria the reason being occasionally uh, one's microalbuminuria could be because of non glomerular causes may for example just a transient increase in blood pressure orthostatic proteinuria where some you know, albumin can be lost in the urine uh, 
increased stress. So those probably would label them that yes, they have an endovascular damage, but if the next test could be negative. But if you are consistent at a gap of three burns that there is a persistence of microbial rate, somewhat proves that the pathophysiology is already in the same direction. That's why the definition has come that yes, twice. And of course, now micral tests and radiomin assay have become very, very specific where even traces of albumin can be confirmed. So it has become a more specific identification by laboratory measures also. And so even one such test which identifies sizable albumin could be pathognomonic. So do you suggest uh, any other uh, investigation for the early pickup of the uh, DKD so that early intervention is there and we can have a better outcome? So, so far there are no such markers, but GFR estimation higher than normal. You know, Indian patients we have seen that average GFR is not like our Western people. It's around 60, 65 ml, sometimes 80 ml is the upper limit of GFR which we see. But someone who is diabetic and his GFR is 110 ml, it is certainly the suspect that he could be in you no know, stage one uh, disease of diabetic kidney disease, very early onset, where hyperfiltration and high GFR is the only marker. And if you do sonograph, you'll see that the average size of kidneys in our Indian population is not more than 8.5 to 9.5. But suppose you see a size which is about 10, then again it, has, it is, raises the suspicion that is going into diabetic early disease. So those two can be considered as a marker of early confirmation. So uh, I think again this very naive question uh, that do we have our own EGFR data or we are following KEDOGI guidelines that this is the EGFR and what is the normal EGFR, any variation is there or no it is standard what we use like HB1C of uh, western population you are also using EGFR of uh, or microalbumina for that matter do we have the yes. separate data or is not required? Yeah, so no, unfortunately, we don't have a separate data. It is badly required because we don't behave same way as our Western population. So if your own GFR standards or microalbuminuria or the other ethnic and racial differences which we have. So currently, there are certain newer formulas which have taken into more factors into consideration. Like, for example, MDRD formula was only considering proteinuria, weight and age of the patient. But now the CKD uh, epidemic formula, which is a new formula, considers all those racial and ethnic components also. So it is improved, but still it is Western. You know, none of the factors could be easily extrapolated to Indian population unless we create our own data, and that is lacking. Thank you. And uh, with that, I hand over mic to our uh, chief moderator, moderator uh, Dr. Murthy, for the final comments. Murthy, sir, please. You are mute, sir. You are mute. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Sir, we can hear you. Yeah. We you can. can hear. Uh, thank you all for another very interactive, useful, and uh, very interesting session. Uh, all three elegant talks starting with Dr. V. Sri Nagesh, Diabetic Prevention Addressing Implementation Challenge. You have so clearly explained the problems involved. You have emphasized how important motivation is and you have also explained the expectation has to be realistic. The patient cannot come up and uh, with all unrealistic expectation and uh, motivation is important, lifestyle, diet and uh, Yes, it's possible in certain cases that you could either pre sorry, postpone or prevent pre-diabetes going on to diabetes, GDM to type 2 DM. And you elaborated uh, the findings of a couple of studies and very interesting, the our local study from Kerala, the Kerala Diabetic Prevention Program. And education, as you rightly pointed out, is not enough. Patients have to be motivated and educated and we have to here compete with Dr. Google and the WhatsApp, no doubt about it. We have got enough challenges as far as the vaccination itself is concerned. And honestly, uh, I have very great difficulty in convincing patients. Uh, you know, hopefully others should have a better uh, experience. Now coming to the next talk by Dr. Saumitra Kumar on the scored and soloist uh, uh, studies. Yes, sotaglyphosin is a, du a dual HGL2 and HGL2-1 inhibitor. 
lot of promise unfortunately because of the covid and lack of funding it is uh, the study has been stopped we don't have adequate information data hopefully one say why and i'll also be very interested to see if there is a, you know head to head uh, you know study between an sgl2 inhibitor and the um, dual um, uh, the sgl lta1 and uh, sgl2 dual therapy so head to head within this and sgl2 inhibitor now coming to the third talk by dr of uh, by dr mukesh shetty translating diabetes and kidney clinical tri trials finding it's very important as you rightly pointed out from the lab to the clinical outcome from uh, the bed to the bed of uh, thing going from the table to the bedside very important and uh, you also pointed out how as or ar be significantly reduce cardiovascular uh, disease and same thing you also pointed out dual blockade yeah. is not beneficial very important on the other hand you said it's harmful uh, with hypertension hyperkalemia and renal damage and uh, the next part of it is as far as the non steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor agonist pineronone provides both kidney and cardiac protection and uh, this is definitely superior as to spironolactone which a higher risk of uh, hyperkalemia of spironolactone and as you kept uh, pointing out and explaining what is from the brain should translate to the bedside so what we talk and see in the lab should have clinical outcomes and for that as you said unless the we empower the patient in addition to the healthcare worker this benefit is not going to translate there is a, definitely a gap between the bench and the bedside and of course in certain studies like the dcct which completed strategies have been involved incorporated into the national diabetic education program so they are trying to see whether they can close the gap between the bench and the bedside and what you see in the lab gets translated into clinical output thank you all for uh, another wonderful session most interactive useful it's been a learning process for me throughout thank you all so much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you all thanks we now go to the third module uh, and the chair person for that is dr sandeep mathur dr sandeep mathur is senior professor in head department of endocrinology and is in charge of molecular genetic research lab m sms medical college and hospital jaipur fellowship in molecular genetic physiological genomic group imperial college school of medicine amersmith hospital is worked in there between october 2003 to february 2004 several chapters is written in textbook and several publication in peer reviewed journals both national and international dr sandeep mathur the stage is all yours Thank you very much, Dr. Murthy. Uh, my pleasure, and first of all, my thanks to organizers for this opportunity to uh, moderate this session. Actually, it is uh, very close to clinical practice. Uh, there are two facets of this module. Uh, first facet related to drug combination and relative efficacy of the drugs. So, drug combinations, which is very important in clinical practice in general practice, we are flooded with so many compounds. it is really challenge for a clinician to select the most appropriate drug for a uh, patient so what are the uh, criteria for drug selection so uh, that will be discussed here and second point is what are the combinations so relative merit and combination and the second facets of this uh, module is related to point of care hba1c estimation actually point of care means hba1c is measured when either by the patient at his residence or in the doctor's clinic a result is instantaneously available so from practice and diagnostic and patient communication and ease of the patient point of view this is an strategy and uh, that will be discussed in this module 
so uh, we have three talks uh, in this module uh, first talk is by dr altmas sheikh uh, and he will be talking about match maker make me a match selecting glucose lowering combination for type 2 diabetes mellitus so dr altmas is consultant uh, diabetologist physician at shefi hospital in bombay and there are several awards to his credit i think uh, there is a long list of awards so many best best award best award best awards so i heard him several times a wonderful speaker i think he is very 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 coming up young very popular speaker in the uh, clinical diabetes forum so over to dr uh, altmas thank you sir for that uh, very very kind introduction and good words for, about me good evening, good afternoon everybody i think i'm going to talk about the ada deciphering session of 2021 and i'm going to bring out to you six points those were discussed in this particular session so what are these combinations how do they help us in making that match and which combinations we should be careful how do we give those deciphering points to you i'm going to talk to you so i think point number 1 i'm going to talk to you about is going to be on incretins and sgl2 inhibitors then we'll shift to insulin and sgl2 inhibitors then combination of two injectable drugs insulin and glp ra1 glp1 rs then dual agonist and triple agonist what was talked in ada then we have some combined statements of various guidelines and i think lastly we'll talk about what are disease modifying drugs in diabetes dmds that was a new term which was introduced in this year's ada so coming to the first one that we were discussing our very famous dr raj defonso who gave the omnius octet the pathophysiology of diabetes the the man behind that he speaks about a triple combination therapy in ada he says that the triple combination of sglt2 inhibitor the glp1 ra and a tzd or a pioglitazone will be really really helpful for various reasons and the reasons he gave was one to optimally answer achievement of uh, uh, glycemic control prevention of microvascular disease and also prevention in renal disease or renal complications so while talking this he says that there are at least six uh, of the octets or six of the causes of diabetes which are addressed by the glp1 rs which is very important to address these pathophysiologic disturbances in the present type of diabetes moving on to his part 2 of the combination about tzds he says that Pioglitazone is a cost-effective. He adds that it is also a cardioprotective drug for type two diabetes. So apart from the six pathophysiologic defects which the GLP one RA are taking, pioglitazone is also talking about the relation to the fat in relation to CV protection. And then he concludes finally by saying that the triple therapy with SGLT two one inhibitor with GLP one RA and pioglitazone. will optimally bring good glycemic control will give will do prevention of microvascular disease at all levels will help in prevention and treatment for cv as well as renal complications so this was point number 1 which came out very well and that was the for, uh, first point then we have dr shantel matthew who she spoke about the combination of insulin with sglt2 inhibitor so one injectable and one oral previous one was one injectable and two oral here it's one injectable and one oral and she says it is quite logical she felt to combine sglt2 with insulin in type 2 diabetes because of their pathophysiological action and also the mechanism these two drugs try to bring together one thing of note she says that when you are adding sglt2 inhibitors to an insulin regimen be careful about reduction in insulin doses of around 10 to 50% to start with if the patient is fragile she, she, she talks about use maybe reduce reduce the dose of around 5 to 10% and then then take it and most importantly she says that the trial data that uh, dr shantel matthew presented it has shown that combining sglt2 inhibitors and insulin is completely beneficial especially in those people with high hpa1c and importantly with lowering of uh, the insulin doses and also that it will cause less weight gain so on one side dr shantel says that it will reduce your doses of insulin on another side it will reduce weight of the patient on another side it will reduce hba1c weightage so what she finally says is the price in some people if the patients are not selected k 
carefully for administration of HCL2 inhibitor. In those cases, Dr. Shantil Matthew says that the price to pay while combining insulin and HCL2 inhibitors would be glycosuria, uh, uh, which may cause genital mycotic infections in some. But luckily, in our Indian context, we have seen very rarely these mycotic infections coming up, although we have seen UTI is a little more common. So that's how we decipher ADA 2021 for this particular combination for our type 2 diabetes patient. And it's and that's how we move to the point number three, the two injectable combination, insulin as well as GLP-1 RA combination. And this was given by Dr. Tina Wibol. The Dr. Tina Wibol says that when you combine these two injectable therapies, this becomes most effective glucose lowering agent because it again covers a vast array of pathophysiological defects and that it is very effective to get HbA1c under control from this particular point according to her and she adds further that patients on insulin with CVD are potential candidates also for SGLT2 inhibitor and or GLP-1 RA therapy because once the patient is on this particular combination it helps the patient compliance it helps the patient to be considered for their good adherence and compliance as well as the fasting and HbA1c target should be decided before starting therapy I think that's a very important clinical pearl which we should use for our Indian patients also to improve adherence and compliance is one of the most important thing because of unreasonable expectations and unrealistic expectations that our patients may have so decide the target prior to starting these things counsel the patient talk to them finally what she says is the diabetes therapy is more about talking to the patient making them comfortable look at the patient preference look at the patient cuisine look at the patient affordability look at how the patient is going to re literally do it including their literacy level and including their level of understanding and you have to take multiple factors into co co combination multiple factors into this uh, combination and the competence of the patient and the family members also which will help to comply with these combinations and will help us i think moving on to the fourth point which was uh, by dr uh, david uh, dlso who talks about dual agonists, the dual peptides, and he says in his trial, which concludes like this, that the dual agonists were better than the placebo in type 2 diabetes, but however, the magnitude of results are not really promising. So this becomes a really important study. He, he talked about the studies on the mice, and he talked about the studies on humans. However, he says that if if the receptors of insulin and other molecules which come metabolically in the path of diabetes if we use multi receptor agonist which perform the function of all the individual receptor agonists that's going to be much better it will give us much good results in controlling uh, diabetes in getting again getting the hang of the control of complications of diabetes and that these agonists should give us a better results in much more future human trials so that was uh, number four and what he concluded finally was that the multi-receptor agonist strategy drug development is going to be the future is going to be effective and we need a little more better understanding so i think uh, we do not know how many of these patients uh, from such trials would be in relation to indian context i think time will tell us when these trials are done by dr david uh, uh, LSEO, he's going to let us uh, know about which centers in India would be selected for these kind of uh, combination. So coming to point number five about algorithms between ADA, between EASD and ACE. So American Diabetes Association, European Association of Study for Diabetes and the American uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, they all have given their guidelines, they all have given their targets, but they common thing what what they have is that the key to successful therapy in their statements they talk about for the type 2 diabetes is the insight of this particular condition and that there is ability of there should be an ability of the physician to individualize the therapy to this particular patient and the medication characteristics to be matched and then it's to be given to avoid any complications for example somebody with history of a cancer of pancreas somebody with history with a cancer of bladder somebody with history of osteoporosis you would want to give combinations which will be fruitful and not detrimental for that particular uh, patient i think another thing which was given uh, by this particular uh, 
ADA for deciphering it for our population. What we can derive is a disease modifying drugs. So what are these disease modifying drugs in diabetes or DMDs? We of late till now we knew since past 30, 40 years that DMDs have been there for rheumatoid arthritis, the chronic inflammatory joint disorders which help in that. But here we are not talking about MAPs, you're not talking about antibodies, you're talking about renaming the same drug because there is a reduction in renal complication, there is a reduction in cardiovascular complication, there is a longevity of life, there is a reduction in mortality and all cause mortality. So the drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP1 RA, according to this particular uh, paper, they say that it should be a simple approach for type 2 diabetes and that they, they should be called as disease modifying drugs because they do help in the longevity, they do help in reduction of complications and prolonging the life, whether it is uh, SGLT2 or whether it is a GLP-1 RA. I think, ladies and gentlemen, over for now, and we'll meet you in Q&A session. Thank you. Over to chairpersons. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh. Uh, you very nicely uh, summarize the ADA meeting proceedings, and I think carry home messages are very clear, but we will discuss that at the end. And as per the organizers, question and answer will be taken at the end. So please stay with us. So we'll meet again for the question and answer session. Now move over to the uh, next presentation. Next presentation is Dr. Ajay Kumar. And he will be discussing the results of a, a long-term study, a large scale study. Uh, that is GRADE study. Mm -hmm. Actually, the meaning of the GRADE is glycemia reduction approaches in diabetes, a comparative effectiveness basically this is a long-term study done in not in india but in us and uh, they compared four drugs and they came with some very interesting data and i think uh, we have wonderful speaker for this uh, study uh, review and dr ajay kumar is uh, a director diabetes care research center in patna he had been principal investigator in indap study for bihar he has participated in large number of drug trials. In fact, uh, number goes as big as uh, that I can speak for 20 minutes on those studies. And he is author of several book chapters, a large number of publication to his uh, credit. So over to Dr. Ajay Kumar. It's my pleasure and privilege to be part of this scientific feast that we have been witnessing over the last couple of days. And my brief this afternoon is to decipher the information presented at ADA about the greatest study about which the chairperson has very nicely introduced. Now it's very important for all of us to appreciate that when we treat patients of type 2 diabetes, we generally start with lifestyle modification and metformin. But then that's not enough for majority of the patients and we need to understand that we will add one or the other medication or a combination of medications. Now, great study exactly tried to answer this question, but in the process, what we see that at one particular point of time, when a study is designed, it takes into consideration the prevailing availability of the drugs and the trend at that point of time. And considering that into our, you know, discussion, we had these four classes of drugs which were added to patients of type 2 diabetes who had an HbA1c between 6.8% to 8.5%. And this is very logical because if you have an A1c which is close to 1 or 1.5% more, then only there is a room for adding a single drug. Otherwise, you would have needed to add combination drugs over metformin. So I think GRADE was in the right direction. And the four drugs that were chosen at that point of time was glimepiride, which is a sulfonylurea, Cetagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and insulin glargine, which is a basal insulin. One can ask that why SGLT2 inhibitor was not added. So let me explain that right in the beginning. That was clarified by one of the speakers during the great presentation, that at that point of time, the FDA-approved drugs did not include SGLT2 inhibitor. Canagliflozin was just knocking the door, but when the trial started, a little after the start of the trial, canagliflozin was approved by the FDA. And it was not possible for many logistic regions to include SGLT2 subsequently in the course of the trial because it was a very well-designed trial which was supposed to go on 
for almost four to eight years time. In fact, on completion, we have the five years data. So that clearly explains as to why these four drugs were chosen. Now, what was the primary end point of this particular study? And this is very important to understand because when you look at the results, you might confuse. This is one trial where the primary output is actually a failure. So those patients of type 2 diabetes who are not on target, as I said, 6.8% to 8.5%, they were added a drug. And if they continued to have an A1C of more than 7%, we know that in majority of the patients, we have an A1C target of less than 7%. So after three months or so, if that particular patient is beyond 7%, then this is called the primary endpoint. That means this particular drug has failed in this particular patient. And there was a secondary endpoint that subsequent to that, in the further follow-up, if in spite of the combination or whatever rescue medication, medication was used, and in this case, it was the protocol which said that if somebody has failed on glimepiride plus metformin, then the next, next drug has to be insulin glargine. So in all the failure arms, it was insulin glargine which was added. And then if on that combination, that is the secondary endpoint, 7.5%, you will still fail, then you have a tertiary endpoint where patients on metformin, the other drug and insulin glargine, and yet the 7.5% target is not achieved, then you need to further intensify the treatment. So we have the primary endpoint, secondary endpoint, and the tertiary endpoint. The, the important thing that has to be considered by the audience this afternoon is that this was an American study. This was only recruiting people from America, no other part of the world, and no Indian patient, no Asian patients were recruited, except for a very small 4% of the Asian population which are residing in the United States of America. So that caveat is there, and before we proceed to translate the results of this particular study into our clinical practice. The second important thing is that the baseline characteristics of all the four groups, almost a little more than 5,000 patients were recruited. That gives you almost 1,200 odd patients in each of the arms. And as I said, metformin plus glimepiride or metformin plus citagliptin, metformin plus liraglutide or metformin plus insulin glargine. So what happens? Now, let me first tell you about few of the very interesting facts about the trial. In spite of being a very long-term trial, the adherence rate was more than 90%. In fact, the data is available for 98.5% of the patients. And the last one year of the trial was affected by Corona, the epidemic, the pandemic of Corona. And even in that, the percentage of patients who completed the trial was a little less than 90%, that is 89 or 88 point something percent. So we have a fairly good outcome of the study and whatever data is there is a robust data and we can dwell upon the analysis of that particular data. So having given you the background of this study, now let us look at the outcome which was presented by, you know, eminent endocrinologists of the world like David Nathan, John Buse, Stephen Kahn. They are all the who's who's of the diabetes and endocrinology in the world. I'm not going to take individual names for each of the data. but it's important to appreciate that what exactly happened. Now, when you fail on a patient of metformin, then when you add any of these four drugs, the fastest that you fail that happened in grade study was with citagliptin, which tells you that amongst the four drugs, citagliptin is least effective in terms of maintaining an HbA1c with a target of less than 7%. The second in line was glimepiride. So glimepiride was a little better than citagliptin in terms of maintaining the HbA1c in less than 7%. And that was followed by insulin glargine and that was followed by GLP-1 receptor agonist liraglutide. So at the end of the study, when you look at the entire data, there were significant differences between insulin glargine, GLP-1 receptor agonist on one side and citagliptin and glimepiride on the other side. A statistically significant difference, but there was no statistically significant difference between GLP-1 receptor agonist liraglutide and insulin glargine. So the first message that clearly comes out of this great study is that liraglutide and insulin glargine are far superior in terms of achieving a good glycemic control for a prolonged period of time. And this is a very important message. 
The second important thing is that when you start failing, you keep on adding drugs and that is called rescue medication. So you have to look at the secondary endpoint and then the tertiary endpoint. So after one year of the study and in the first year, as I said, citagliptin was fastest to fail. But subsequently, most of the lines remained parallel. At the end of four years or five years, now we have given you the data that GLP-1 receptor agonist liraglutide came on the top, slightly followed by insulin glargine, though no statistically significant difference. Now, this is very important to understand that these were the patients of type 2 diabetes who were only taking metformin. And this is extremely important. These are not treatment naive patients. Neither these are patients who are fairly advanced in their, you know, natural history of type 2 diabetes because they are on monotherapy. The inclusion criteria clearly mention that these patients have to be of less than 10 years of diabetes duration and they must be taking only metformin at least 500 milligram. And in the, you know, initial phase of the study for two weeks, they were tit up titrated to have the recommended dose 2 grams of metformin, 1 to 8 milligrams of glimepiride, insulin glargine titrated to get a fasting plasma glucose of 80 to 130 and liraglutide from 0.6 milligram to 1.8 milligram. So these are the standard doses, but just to recapitulate, this was the standard tre treatment given to all the four arms of the patient. Now, having looked at the outcome in terms of glycemic control and the duration of control, the other conclusion that we draw from this great study discussion that happened at the ADA was that 71 to 73 percent of the patients eventually failed, which means that after three years time, only 29 percent of the patients on a combination therapy keep themselves in the target of HbA1c of less than 7 percent. All others will require additional medications, which clearly tells you that type 2 diabetes is a very difficult ball game. You need to understand that this is a condition characterized by inexorable decline in beta cell function and you have to keep on escalating therapy. You have to keep an eye on your patient. The next issue is the microvascular outcome and the macrovascular outcomes because the only purpose of looking at the outcome in a type 2 diabetic treatment plan is that it's not only the glycemic control that we are looking at, but whether it makes a salutary impact in reducing the microvascular complication as well as the macrovascular complication. So let me first decipher the discussion that happened around the microvascular complications. What were the endpoints which I looked at? The albumin creatinine ratio, the EGFR, and in terms of neuropathy, the important thing was the peripheral sensory neuropathy. Now, unfortunately, at the end of the study, none of these four arms showed any significant, statistically significant difference amongst each other. That means the microvascular complications will continue to rise, which was seen in this particular study. And there was no difference in the four arms in terms of, you know, a particular benefit in terms of reducing either the renal complication or the neurological complications. So what is the message that we get? that whatever benefit in terms of reducing microvascular complication happens, it happens because of good glycemic control. It is not a property of an individual drugs. Having said that, we also know that after the GRADE study, we had number of dedicated cardiovascular outcome studies in which the renal endpoints were very robustly looked at. And we know that certain classes of drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGLT2 inhibitors actually have a very big impact in reducing the cardiorenal outcomes. Therefore, if the GRADE study had more patients or was followed for a longer period of time, whether this difference will become manifest, it is a matter of conjecture. But at this point of time, so far as the GRADE results are concerned, that did not show any difference in the microvascular outcome in the four different groups. Then coming to the macrovascular outcomes, there was a very clear trend when we look, look at the outcome in terms of cardiovascular diseases, the three-point maze, the heart failure, the total mortality, the cardiovascular mortality, it was a very clear trend that liraglutide outperformed insulin, glargine, glimepiride and citagliptin. Liraglutide had the minimum incidence of cardiovascular diseases in the five years follow-up. Although when they looked at the maze and the heart failure and the total mortality, there was no significant difference. Another very important thing is that these are preliminary results. 10% of the patients have still not been adjudicated
from this particular study for the cardiovascular outcome. Therefore, in future, we expect a lot of other analysis to come out from the greater study and that will throw much more light as to what exactly will happen and whether the graph of the benefit of liraglutide will continue to diverge if the study was, you know, continued for a longer period of time. Because we don't treat type 2 diabetes patients only for 5 years. We treat type 2 diabetes patients for 3, 4 decades for a particular patient. And this is extremely important that if you can demonstrate a significant difference within a span of 4 to 5 years time, that can certainly be magnified when you actually follow these patients on a longer term basis. Now, having looked at these outcomes of the GRADE study, now the important thing is how to translate what lessons do we learn from this particular study in terms of translating this into our clinical practice. As I said, all four drugs are good. When I say that there were differences in the achieving the glycemic control, maintaining the glycemic control, there were differences. But at the same time, it has to be appreciated that all four, all four drugs were effective. Citagliptin was least effective, followed by glibiparide, followed by glargine, followed by liraglutide. And liraglutide offered the additional advantage of reducing the cardiovascular disease. No significant difference in the microvascular complication. There are many other important things which actually go into the protocol of this particular study that they are looking at various parameters in terms of even pharmacogenomic responses of these individual classes of drug. But those analysis will come in future and at this point of time, we can only stipulate or we can make conjectures about the possible mechanism as to why insulin glargine and liraglutide were better as compared with glimepiride and DPP-4 inhibitors. And we can take those issues during the question answer session. But this is the major, you know, results, design and the outcomes and the possible explanations of the results of the GRADE study. I think we, I, we, I stop here and then take up questions during the question answer session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajay Kumar. You nicely presented the results and the design of this study. I think many, many things are very crystal clear and you right, di uh, rightly give us the direction of discussion of certain novel aspects of the subject like pharmacogenomics. Really very, very interesting subject and I will discuss that subject during discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajay Kumar. Please be with us because we will be come, we will come back for, uh, for question and answers. So coming to the next presentation, so these two talks were related to your drugs and their combination, their relative efficacy. Now coming to the diagnostic aspect, because as you know, in practice, you are getting so many kits of actually self home HbA1c estimation or HbA1c estimation kits are available for HbA1c measurement in the clinic. When the patient is sitting in front of you, we call it point of care HbA1c estimation. Now, question is this point of care HbA estimation is really worth in your practice? Is it really worth in diagnosing diabetes? So, uh, so this subject was discussed in EDM meeting and it will be reviewed here by Dr. Jay Prakash. Jay Prakash is consultant endocrinologist, is Medical Trust Hospital. Kochi, I think here it is little Annaculum, the same thing, Annaculum and Kochi. And uh, he is a winner of several awards, a lot many publications to his credit, and is participating in so many calls. So over to Dr. Jay Prakash. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Mathur, for the kind introduction. It's a privilege to be here in this uh, forum to discuss the um, ADA 2021 silent aspects. So the topic uh, which I'll be discussing is uh, the usage of point of care HbA1c testing for the diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, there was a, a debate in ADA on this and uh, uh, I would be covering that. We know HbA1c has been useful in managing diabetes uh, since almost two decades now. It has been well validated, well used uh, for managing patients with diabetes because of its uh, reasons being that is easily done, uh, the availability has improved and it correlates well with uh, the outcomes, microvascular complications and cardiovascular disease. The correlation with HbA1c has been well uh, validated and documented and all the studies and all the patient outcome data that we are generating uh, with respect to patients with diabetes are 
mainly uh, now based on HP1C results. So the point of care HP1C testing has, has been available and that is uh, as the chairperson told that has been useful but the question is whether it is useful for the diagnosis of uh, diabetes. Diabetes diagnosis uh, is uh, a major decision for the patient and for the doctor because uh, all the decisions in terms of treating the disease and putting the diagnosis is based on that and whether the point of care testing is well validated enough to diagnose HP and uh, to diagnose diabetes that's what uh, the debate was. So uh, the point of care testing is uh, as uh, Professor Madhura had told is uh, it's there is actually a definition for point of care testing it's an investigation which is uh, carried out in the clinical setting where the patient is there or even at the patient's home for which uh, the result is available without validating with an external lab and uh, mostly the results are immediately available within 5 to 10 minutes. So that's what a point of care testing is and uh, there are various uh, methods of HbA1c point of care testing. So uh, whether that is good enough for making the diagnosis of diabetes. So there were uh, the debate was uh, uh, by two uh, persons, one uh, uh, Dr. J. Shambrook from Australia. Uh, he was the one who was speaking for uh, the usage of HPNC point of care testing and uh, Dr. David Sachs was the one who was against uh, using uh, HPNC as a point of care testing uh, for diagnosis. So uh, first I will discuss the points uh, by Dr. J. which he had mentioned that uh, one major advantage of using uh, point of care testing is that the time which was needed to get the result uh, it is available in, in a matter of uh, 10 minutes and as the patient is there in the clinic itself you get the HP1C result and just like any other HP1C sample it doesn't matter whether it is fasting or whether uh, the patient uh, the timing of the day it doesn't matter. So at the clinic visit you have the result and uh, that uh, improves uh, the compliance and uh, decreases the length of uh, stay in, in, in the clinic or in the hospital. That's probably all the more important in, in the current times of uh, uh, pandemic where uh, the length of interaction is to be minimized. It also reduces sampling errors. Uh, you, you need to have a finger prick uh, just like uh, the glucometer testing. So uh, the errors while taking the sample is minimized. Uh, and also the technical issues, um, even though they are uh, now minimized, but the sampling errors and uh, in the lab which can uh, errors which can occur is also not there. Uh, the other advantage of getting an immediate result was also stressed by him by uh, you get uh, the result and the immediate feedback and the counseling can be done uh, rather than you uh, give the test and then asking the patient to come back on another day and then um, get, uh, counseling about the result you get the immediate uh, result and counseling at that time. Uh, the economy aspect is also there. Uh, Every clinic visit, uh, you the patient has to spend time and money and uh, two visits to show the test report uh, versus a single visit. The result get, getting in five to ten minutes. Uh, so obviously, it's more advantageous for the patient also. Now we know that uh, uh, teleconsultation and phone consultations are there, but then uh, counseling the patient with the result when the physical uh, consultation uh, it uh, um, uh, in, in everybody's experience is better in terms of uh, the patient acceptance and probably compliance. So uh, these were the ease of use and uh, uh, the less technical issues were the ones which were actually stressed by uh, Dr. J in terms of its uh, favorable uh, points for diagnosis of uh, uh, HbA1c uh, diagnosis of diabetes with point of care HbA1c. Uh, the person who was speaking against Dr. David Sachs uh, uh, against the usage of point of care HPNC testing, uh, his uh, points were mainly uh, uh, stressed on the accuracy of the result. 
again as i said you're making a diagnosis of a disease uh, which has got its own long term implications so you need to be the test to be very accurate to give the confidence of uh, diagnosis and also treating the patient so according to dr david sachs uh, the accuracy in terms of uh, this point of care testing uh, may not be as good as a lab HP1C result. So uh, it's actually a CLIA wavered result, uh, clinical laboratory uh, um, investigation analysis wavered result, where uh, the, the HP1C point of care kits doesn't need an external validation. So whether this is good enough uh, to diagnose or to make a diagnosis uh, is a question which is raised by him. And there are studies which have shown that there is discrepancy between the point of care test kits and the lab values. Uh, other issues like uh, the HB hemoglobin variants, which are probably relevant to our uh, population also, they're like uh, the thalassemia variant and sickle cell variant. These variants are not, uh, we don't have the data whether it can affect the point of care HB1C kits. So again, making a diagnosis uh, according to Dr. David Sachs uh, may not be uh, good enough. Other co-existent conditions like anemia, CKD, liver disease, what's the impact of that? Uh, these diseases, which are actually very common in patients with diabetes, uh, whether they have an impact of this in the point of care uh, kits, uh, again, uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, these kits are costly. That's one of the aspects which was raised against this the cost of the kit these are not cheap unlike a glucometer testing uh, it doesn't come out cheap and uh, the current technical issue again even though it's a drop of blood but the kits need unlike a glucometer strip the uh, conduct of the test should be uh, done properly and uh, it if it's not temperature maintained if it's not maintained in the correct sampling then the result may be varied so the accuracy may be uh, uh, is the main point which was uh, stressed uh, by uh, as a debate against this. So after uh, the this debate, there was a uh, 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 talk by Dr. Randall Little, uh, where she tried to bring both the points together. So uh, what was discussed by Dr. Little was that uh, yes, there are uh, fallacies in the HP1C point of care kits, but then. Um, now, uh, some of the latest kits, like the Bayer uh, kits, they use NGSP standard protocols. So, the National Glycohemoglobin Standardized Protocols, which was derived from the DCCT data. Uh, the kits uh, in these uh, well validated point of care testing kits, they perform as good as uh, the, the standard lab method of doing HB1C. So, uh, the advantage is obviously being um, having an immediate result, having the result uh, in the patient uh, where the patient is, is there in the clinic and uh, using the right kind of kits that, that was being stressed by uh, Dr. Randall. So uh, I think this uh, summarizes uh, the uh, usage of HB1C point of care testing as, as far as the diagnosis, the idea debate which had occurred. And, there's no uh, consensus and still uh, I think for monitoring the ADA recommends this but for the diagnosis of diabetes the point of care HP1C testing kits are still not well validated to be made to probably with the improvement and with more of data it would be made uh, for the diagnosis uh, it would be recommended for the diagnosis of diabetes also the point of care HP1C testing. So thank you we will take uh, more questions on this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jayaprakash, uh, for nicely, you know, one-man debate. So you spoke in favor and against the one-man debate, and you nicely presented that. So I invite you uh, to other speakers also, Dr. Ajay Kumar and Dr. Sheikh, uh, for question and answer sessions. Hello. So I would like to begin with uh, Dr. Sheikh with you. Uh, so very basic sure. question. Yes. Suppose a patient comes to you in your clinic and already done metformin. Uh, now you add, yeah, thank you, Dr. Murthy, for being with us again <laughs> because you are the main coordinator. Thank you so much. Uh, 
yeah the basic question is because if uh, we have to add one more medicine or should we escalate the uh, dose of existing medication you understand in other way round is combination better than monotherapy uh, to make it more clear highest dose of monotherapy or sub optimum or sub mini or sub threshold dose of two drugs this is the question so what's your opinion on that point yeah. i like sure, it's a very good question sir i think Yeah, let it's me clarify. It's a very good question, sir. I think. Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you one more point. Somebody is already on fifteen okay. milligram yes. per liter. On should we increase to thirty or forty-five milligram, or should we add another medicine if the patient not on the target? So this type of situation is very common in clinical practice. So I want your opinion on that point. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. It's a very uh, uh, nice question. Very, very clinically oriented. So I think what we've been uh, telling to all our patients that it is the target of HbA1c and the target of prevention of complications. That is what we are looking in the long term. So without causing hypoglycemia, without causing a weight gain, and giving a good quality of life, maybe use two or three drugs in combination, not full doses, but start with. the minimal tolerated doses of the drug to give the desired action first in the first 3 months to get the hb1c so whether the patient's hb1c was 11 we'll use a different combination if it's 9 we use different or if it's 8.1 we use different so of course as you said correctly if patient is already on 15 mg we will look at other different factors that the patient is having and not increase just one dose fully so it's always the additive dose of different drugs which will help us to achieve the omnius octate from all the angles that is how we would we would look at it as you said it depends on individual patient's pathophysiology and is response to existing drug suppose somebody is on 15 mg pyrazolam he has gained 4 kg weight i will definitely not increase the dose uh, dr ajay at this point i would like to clarify on the issue of pharmacogenomics you want to say something dr murthy yeah i'm just trying to elaborate on the point you made uh, the teaching in ester years was that at 50% of the maximum advice dose you get about 80% of action so increasing the dose beyond that makes no you know doesn't give you any much benefit rather you could add on another agent working at another point correct perfectly all right perfectly right so uh, dr ajay kumar you mentioned the word pharmacogenomics actually being a molecular endocrinologist uh, pharmacogenomics is my area of interest and you see most of the inter individual variation in response to a drug is related to drug metabolism rather than drug target actually this uh, great study even if they will do pharmacogenomic analysis i know like other literature which is lot many studies on literature they will lead nowhere because they use optimum or sub optimum dose but not based on pharmacogenomic data so uh, i don't think there will be anything uh, very meaningful come out of pharmacogenomic data analysis from this uh, great study so uh, what dr murthy says right optimum dose sub optimum dose to be very frank we will be able to know only when we are using either drug metabolite levels or using genomic data to determine which is the right dose or not correct dose so very complex subject and i think uh, we can't say much on this so second question to dr shake is coming to the physiology you know you came with the concept of drug mod uh, disease modifying drugs i think you came with this concept dmd concept so dmd point of view can we individualize the therapy for a patient even optimum or sub optimum dose of a drug and their combinations towards some specific goal uh, can i give an example somebody is already is suppose body weight is around uh, bmi is 22 He is on metformin. HbA1c is uh, 9.7. So he is from a family which had diabetic nephropathy, and there is a strong CAG history. 
what do you how you will treat that sort of patient with you increase the dose of metformin and there get some medicine or you will come with a combination because there are expected multiple complications because of the genetic background so what's your opinion on that point should we go for two three drug combination two drug combination or escalate one then add another third one like this okay another very interesting clinical question sir i think uh, let's recapitulate you said 22 years boy with genetic history of uh, diabetes and nephropathy and nephropathy hba1c is, is around 9 9.3 9.2 9.2 9.2 9.2 patient is already on metformin yes and no, I, I, so we do not have the bmi or we do not have to all the speakers yeah yeah shake you go ahead so this is one case exactly which talks about how do you modify the disease knowing that this patient is a genetic predisposition and has got a high genetic uh, effect which can leave this patient for nephropathy in fact there are patients and families which come doctor my grandmother had this now my father has this how do i help uh, uh, myself about this so here is that term how they have uh, given in the, the ada talking about the modify the disease outcome and exactly as i said in the first uh, case also in the example that it is the target hb1c and the target organ damage that we need to prevent so definitely one of the two drug should be started one first basic reason because the hb1c is uncontrolled and two because of the family history of uh, the nephropathy so we would definitely be using a drug uh, here first maybe an sgl2 inhibitor and looking at bmi and looking at uh, patient's profile looking at patient's uh, dietary habits also here this patient should be on another drug which here could be an glp1 or we do not know we have not seen the patient yet we still not need to know what is the urine acr what is the retinopathy is there another family history of ca pancreas or something else so it is going to be a full chart full data from the patient and then we would but uh, to start with an sglt2 for this particular patient would definitely be yes after patient education thoroughly about how you can prevent uh, infections and how you can prevent genital mycotic infections and uh, so on so modifying of disease yes yeah so for disease modification now i am asking the same question to dr uh, ajay kumar and dr murthy and dr jay kumar all three of you uh, in such patient i add pioglitazone and sglt two inhibitors simultaneously uh, that is my practice what is your opinion about it because patient major concern is long term complications and hbm is still 9.2 and there is no risk of severe hyperglycemia with this combination what is your opinion dr murthy for this patient as far as i am concerned I don't think yeah. you have a better insulin sensitizer than pioglitazone without any doubt. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, because of rosiglitazone, uh, you you know, a rosiglitazone is also a good molecule. Pioglitazone has gone out of favor, except probably yeah. in certain situation like uh, women in postmenopausal age who, who got a risk of fracture, or there is. Uh, Uh, you know a basic of cardiovascular disease fluid accumulation or so i think i totally agree with you pioglitazone is still an excellent drug i don't think you have a better insulin sensitizer than pioglitazone and diabetes is a problem of insulin resistance no doubt about it and with hgl2 inhibitor it makes an excellent combination because the fluid part of it weight gain is also taken care of by yeah. hcl2 inhibitor and as far as insulin sensitivity no doubt about pioglitazone i don't think uh, we, have, we have ever had a drug which can match that yeah dr ajay what is your opinion on this point i am asking dr ajay kumar sir you are senior so i always tell you sir you are not audible sir he is not audible am i not audible am i not no, audible? audible no audible yeah okay what what i wanted to say that whenever we use pioglitazone i am sure everybody does this that we have to be a little vigilant any patient who is you know getting exponentially weight or is developing edema and so on and so forth even we we very clearly look for even the covert left ventricular dysfunction even if there is no manifest symptom 
So long as we take care of this, I agree with Dr. Murthy that in my practice, pioglitazone is one of the commonest used molecules. And I will reiterate what he said that when we address the issue of insulin resistance, metformin will only address 35% of the insulin resistance. Almost 65 to 70% of the insulin resistance actually is in muscles and adipose tissue, not in liver. And that is precisely addressed by pioglitazone. Metformin will only address the issue of insulin resistance at the level of liver. And therefore, in majority of the patients, pioglitazole will turn out to be a very good agent in combination with other recommended drugs, so long as we keep a very close vigil on our patient to keep an eye on those possible side effects, which has to be taken into account. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, you want to say anything on this point? Yes, sir. I agree with that completely uh, because pioglitazone has got all the bad name for the wrong reasons, I think. So, yeah, uh, yeah. but as uh, Dr. Ajigumar had told, we should be more vigilant in terms of its usage. It's not a molecule like a DP4 inhibitor where you can just use it left and right. Um, in this patient, which you are talking about, the third drug, if it's not getting controlled, would be a combination of GLP-1 agonist. So that would uh, yeah. cover all the aspects and uh, would be better in terms of uh, the drug interaction also. So next question to Dr. Ajay Kumar, sir, uh, if I ask you in few lines, can you summarize the results of uh, grade study? In two, three lines, what yeah. is the carry home from grade study, sir? So very clear, patients of type 2 diabetes who have failed on monotherapy of metformin, if you wish to add next drug, the most ideal would be a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Data is very robust. It will give you long-term control, very effective control. That is followed by insulin glargine. That is followed by glimiparide and that is followed by DPP-4 inhibitor. That is, you know, the sequence of efficacy and robustness in terms of the duration of efficacy. That's the first part. What I clearly didn't mention because of the interest of the time was the side effect profile. Almost all four drugs are very well tolerated. As expected, liraglutide will lead to some amount of GI side effects in the beginning, which settles out after three to four weeks time. And glimiparide actually showed slight excess in terms of hypoglycemia. What came out as a big surprise was that insulin glargine did not show an increased risk of hypoglycemia as compared with any of the other three yeah. arms. And that is very yes. encouraging that when we use basal insulin, we are not running a very high risk of inducing a lot of hypoglycemia to our patients. And therefore, this is a very robust outcome from the GRADE study. Now, the point that you mentioned about the pharmacogenomics and the data which is going to be analyzed out of the GRADE study is that it's not only the pharmacogenomics. They are looking at so many data. They are looking at the markers of insulin resistance. They are looking at the markers of beta cell function. They are looking at the markers of genetic uh, possibilities. And all these combined together will definitely show a light that if at all there is a long duration of control with liraglutide, is it because of the beta cell protective effect? If there is cardiovascular benefit, is it because of some molecular control of the GLP-1 receptors that we are talking about? So in the long run, and particularly with the modern times and the use of artificial intelligence, this gold mine of data is going to give us a lot of information in future. And therefore, we should be eagerly looking forward to the analysis coming out of all this discussion. So now a uh, very pertinent question, can we translate those results in our thin fat phenotype because we are genetically yeah. different the genetic difference is not great but the most important difference is your know, indian pathobiology is poor adipogenesis and more central fat deposition because of thin limbs so i am working in genomics of indian fat distribution i know it is the poor fat deposition in limb which lead to excess deposition of the abdomen this type of patient this phenotype is entirely different from the phenotype which is more of more obesity related problems do you think we need our own efforts to answer this question or we can translate as such <laughs> i couldn't agree more you have hit the nail i think when it comes yes. to using insulin i would be very reluctant to use only a basal insulin the majority of my patients of type 2 diabetes yes. because as you very yeah. rightly said the asian phenotype is completely different the amount of yeah. carb content that we have in our food, the amount of PPG at the time of insulin initiation, we have very robust data that majority yeah. of the patient will need a combination insulin, but certainly a combination insulin which is safe, convenient, does not increase the risk of hypoglycemia and yet gives you the same efficacy. 
Similarly, in terms of the oral drugs also, we know that for some reason, the Asian phenotype respond very well to DPP-4 inhibitor, whereas the, the yes. Caucasian yeah. phenotype, they do not respond to DPP-4 inhibitor to that extent. We have data from India, very good data by Dr. Mohan and many other researchers who have clearly shown an A1C reduction of more than 2% with sitagliptin and metformin combination. So yes, you are absolutely correct that it would be much better that now with all the frontline 5 or 6 drugs, we have some study like GRADE which is conducted in India on significant number of patients which gives us the statistical power to address this particular question. Thank you. Sir, actually, I would like to add pyoglitazone in this type of study. Very important drug for our population. Absolutely. So, what's your Absolutely. opinion, Dr. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Just to, yeah, just to, I totally agree with the comments made. Just to add on, uh, another problem uh, is the insulin inertia starting. So, very many times when we are attempting to start insulin, we are already too late to, you know, just stop with the basal and we may require a combination because we don't, uh, you know, start basal insulin at the right time and because of insulin inertia, very many times we are so late that basal insulin alone doesn't work and we may require a combination. So, uh, a question for Dr. Jayaprakash. Uh, do you think kits available in India deserve point of care hb1c estimation what is the practical application of uh, point of care hb1c in our our context yeah i think uh, in our context as far as the diagnosis is concerned i don't think it's we are ready for that for monitoring probably yes uh, the specific problem as far as the kits which are available for us is concerned is uh, one is the temperature stability um, the extremes of temperature that happens in most parts of the country and the humidity, I don't think uh, the HB1C kits, the best kit uh, as far as the studies show is uh, the Roche kit. It is still not validated in terms of the humidity and the extreme temperature conditions. So probably for monitoring the disease, uh, yes, uh, because um, in case of doubt, you can always co correlate, but for the diagnosis of diabetes, uh, again, uh, I don't think we are not yet ready for that uh, as far as point of care testing is concerned. We, we would still need a lab validated. We know the problem with labs also. Uh, many of the labs uh, give uh, still give uh, false HbA1c results. So, uh, yeah. uh, as far as the point of care kits are concerned, uh, in India, uh, we are not yet ready for diagnosis. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, to sum up uh, some of this question answer session before going back to Dr. Murthy, I believe these trials which were conducted in Western Caucasian population, we can't uh, translate their findings into our scenario. And what we need is to do a good study from India. Actually, instead of talking and describing Western results, we should generate our own data. In fact, I am submitting a proposal. I was asked by Ministry of Economic Affairs, Government of India, not by Health Ministry, to come with a, a robust proposal. In fact, I have crafted it and given to, uh, that is in, with my government, it will go to Economic Department because they are mainly concerned about the cost of the care. So, Ministry of Finance is taking interest in this subject rather than Health Ministry. And second point is that, Pharmacogenomics, actually, sir, I, I look into literature. Whatever is the standard design of trials, you start with metformin, not on target, add another medicine, the third medicine. This type of design will never work for pharmacogenomic study. There should be a design which start one drug, monitor drug metabolites, see clinical effects, have some cutoff or escalation of dose and then adjust the dose. Once you have taken into account pharmacodynamics, kinetics, only then pharmacodynamics should come into play. So with this message, uh, over to Dr. Murthy for comments. Sir, again, thank you all for again another such an interactive, wonderful session. I think we have spent about three hours without even realizing, you know, that, uh, you know, we are tired or exhausted. Three hours has just gone by. 
and uh, these interactive sessions without powerpoint presentation how useful it is and how much of information we get you know i could appreciate in this 3 hours so all of you have done a wonderful job excellent thing and uh, i will just make the closing remarks please all of you stay uh, that uh, i would very much uh, like to thank corona uh dr vijay charlu and his team for getting all of us together for such a high level scientific session i know the amount of hard work he and his team so also dr chandrasekhar has been put to you know get together such a program is offering 5 uh, days of uh, ada and then getting a to about 56 or 58 topics which have got some relevance to our indian population then bringing it down to 18 and last sunday also there was an excellent uh, session conducted by professor ashok kumar das following up with this uh, congratulations to vijay charlu and all of you and uh, we would like on behalf of all my colleagues we would like to profusely thank you and please to continue to bring such high level scientific symposia for our learning please continue to do this and uh, thank you all so much it's been a wonderful experience it's been a learning experience for me it was so wonderful being with all of you and uh, i really is not always physical but uh, even a virtual meeting if it can be done like this it's as good as a physical meeting thank you all so much and thank you vijay charlu once more and your team all your colleagues you did and dr chandar sekar again for such a uh, flawless and seamless uh, uh, you know 3 hours of program it just went off so well thank you so much thank you sir uh, it's been a pleasure Uh, talking to you uh, i mean the entire session was illuminated with lot of knowledge uh, it has come from our stars who have descended on earth as i told we don't have to go to norway uh, we can as well stay here and uh, we can see the galaxy of stars the navratnas who spoke for us uh, to thank uh, professor uh, murthy sir for having spared his valuable time on a sunday and in spite of his busy schedule he came across and uh, was ready to course coordinate the entire event it's my personal thanks to you sir and also to the galaxy of speakers the excellent moderators who have really moderated this session the extempo session was something which was a idea which we thought would be very very difficult but then the speakers are of such high level that uh, for us to get them going in terms of the extempo was just a cake walk for them uh, also just to brief you on corona remedies uh, we have two uh, agendas which which we normally have as a organization the first agenda is towards ensuring that uh, we are uh, imparting medical knowledge through a uh, galaxy of uh, professionals who have been in their best of their clinical practices so that the medical fraternity as a whole can gain and second is the patient care so go to the market approach and the patient care is something which is very very important for us and we are doing lot of activities like adopt a village program and lot of other things which will uh, be unveiled very shortly which takes us and also helps us find out those patients because the rule of 50 applies and many of the patients do not uh, are not diagnosed or do not take medications regularly so our efforts is towards ensuring whether the patient is regularly taking the medication and second is whether we are able to diagnose such patients who are undiagnosed so thanks a lot uh, again dr chandrasekhar for the seamless event that you have been giving us uh, you have spent sleepless nights uh, right from the ada time uh, to getting us notes for the ada and to the time uh, where you have done a dry run for most of the speakers so thanks to my entire team at the back end bhavesh shukla sasil alok and the my sales team jayesh vyas and pranav pandit for uh, excellently coordinating and all the sales teams also at the back end for doing a wonderful job thank you so much it's been a pleasure uh, looking forward for such scientific events in the future as well with a different twist thank you have a wonderful evening ahead yeah